The tale of Desmond Miles doesn't span long, just a lifetime. And the bulk of his story, the bulk of his significance to the world takes place in little more than 100 days. But in these 100 days, he experienced multiple lifetimes. With the power of the Animus, he unlocked the story of his DNA, his ancestors. He secured American independence through the eyes of Connor. He saw the wonder and corruption from the tops of grand Renaissance architecture with Ezio. And he saw Altair wrestle with his ego and the power of ancient artifacts as he searched for ultimate truths. Desmond learnt more in these days than anyone could do in a lifetime. Desmond Miles did not choose his path, it was chosen for him. Throughout his life, he has raged against those that hoped to use him for their own ends. In this, he failed. But the choice he would ultimately get to make would be his and his alone. In those 100 days, the skills he's gained, the knowledge he would learn, would get him to that pivotal moment. This is the tale of an ordinary man with an extraordinary lineage and an extraordinary destiny. And it starts here, deep in the buildings of Abstergo Industries in Rome. This is Desmond Miles, and he is trapped. Trapped against his will to perform a task he knows nothing about. It's 2012. Abstergo Industries have no right to hold him. They're a corporate company, famous for their pharmaceutical products, but beneath that facade hides a collective with evil intent. What do they want with Desmond? You have information we need, Mr. Miles. The Abstergo scientists watching Desmond are Drs. Warren Vidich and Lucy Stillman. They assess Desmond while in the Animus. You're inside the Animus. It's a projector that renders genetic memories in three dimensions. Desmond is special because his genetic memories might just help them find the thing that Abstergo desperately need. Desmond grew up in the farm, a commune of the Assassins, an ancient order with a sole purpose to rid the world of tyranny. Desmond comes from a long lineage of great Assassins, one of them being Altair Ibn Laahad. I'm the Patient Wolf, and welcome to my channel. I tell stories, and at the moment I'm on a mission to encapsulate the complete story of the Assassin's Creed franchise, the first five of which tell the story of our hero, Desmond Miles. The sixth instalment Black Flag will be out on this channel very soon, so make sure to subscribe and hit the bell to be informed when it does. A like on this video will do it wonders. Go on, do it now. Each of my videos take hours to record, script and construct, so if you would like to support this work and get exclusive ad-free access weeks before anyone else, then consider joining my Patreon, where patrons contribute to my doing this work for you. So settle in, relax and get ready to experience this complete story. Please enjoy the Pentalogy of Desmond Miles. This is the closest we can get, so it's where we'll have to start. 1191, the Holy Land, war ravaged by King Richard's Crusades. For Altair, there are four cities, connected by the barren lands of the Kingdom of Heaven. Damascus, Acre, Jerusalem and Masyaf, home to the Assassins and their leader, al Mualim. It was al Mualim that sent Altair and two fellow Assassins, Malik and his brother Qadar, on a mission to Jerusalem to retrieve a treasure. I would not have taken the life of an innocent. Follow the creed. It matters not how we complete our task, only that it's done. But this is not the way of- My way is better. Robert de Saab, his life is mine. Do not compromise the Brotherhood. And what is it you want? Blood. No, don't! Ah! I spare you only that you may return to your master and deliver a message. The Holy Land is lost to him and his. Altair's arrogance not only led to the failure of their mission, but his fellow assassins were seemingly doomed. Altair returns to Masyaf to face the wrath 
of Al Mulin. I did. Do not speak, not another word. To compound his shame, Malik arrives having retrieved the treasure, but he returns injured and mourning his brother. He also reports that Robert de Saab is not far behind. Altair's reprimand can wait. The assassins do what they can to defend the city, but soon retreat to the castle. Return what you have stolen from me! My men do not fear death, Robert. They welcome it and the rewards it brings. Go to God! A leap of faith that has fooled the Saab's men. Altair flanks them and springs the trap that ends the siege. But this is not enough to undo Altair's transgressions against the Order. We are nothing if we do not abide by the Assassin's creed. Three simple tenets. Stay your blade. Hide in plain sight. The third and final tenet. Never compromise the Brotherhood. Altair contravened all of these, and all that has happened to Masyaf is due to that. Peace be upon you, Altair. He's executed as a traitor. But this was just the power of suggestion, a warning to Altair, carrying with it a punishment. You'll see you have been stripped of your possessions, your rank as well. To earn his rank back and the favor of Al-Mu'alim, he is given a task, a list of nine names, the death of which will aid in the ending of the crusade and march the Holy Lands towards peace. Altair must do this single-handedly, not with the help of his genius. He must travel to the various cities, do his own legwork, his own research, listening patiently on the streets, using sleight of hand to attain knowledge, chasing down those with information on how to best take out these warmongers that plague these lands. After he has done this, he must ask permission from the Assassin's Bureau to carry out his plan. Altair must swallow his pride and become a novice again. He starts this in Damascus with the weapons dealer, Tamir. Altair has done his research. He knows the evil of this man. He is sure it is Tamir's time to die. Be at peace, for I serve a far nobler cause than mere profit, just like my brothers. Brothers, you've done well, Altair, and I'm confident that this is but the first of many successes. Go now either to Akka or Jerusalem. In those cities, he sees to the death of two more evil men, Garnier de Napoluse, a crusader who drives people to madness testing his herbal concoctions. But in the planning of this kill, Altair uncovers a connection, a cooperation between Garnier, a crusader, and Tamir, a Saracen, and the man he was about to kill, Talal. Providing the test subjects for Garnier was Talal. Why would enemies be working together? I took them not to sell, but to save. You truly believe you were helping them? It's not what I believe. It's what I know. Why are these men not remorseful? They speak as if their work had a higher purpose than just profit. And why were they testing on these subjects? What were they working towards? On his deathbed, Garnier reveals the name of the treasure currently residing in Masyaf. I admit, without the piece of Eden, which you stole from us, my progress was slowed. You've done well. Three of the nine lay dead. Altair is slowly regaining the respect of his brothers. The grandiosity that clouded his judgment is lifting, and he returns to Masyaf to continue the work of his cause. His master provides more names. Majduddin, regent of Jerusalem. Your work here is finished. No, no, it had only just begun. William of Montferrat, liege lord of Akka. Everything I did, I did to prepare them for the new world. Abu Nukud, the wealthiest man in Damas. Is it so different from your own work? A minor evil for a greater good? We are the same. The connection between these seemingly disparate men was now undeniable. They speak of a brotherhood. You cannot stop us. We will have our new world. He needs to know more. Who are they? These men are connected by a blood oath not unlike our own. Non nobis, domine non nobis. Templars. Now you see the true reach of Robert de Sable. Robert de Sable is the linchpin of the secret society, the grand master of the Knights Templar. What do they desire? Conquest. They seek the Holy Land not in the name of God, but for themselves. That is why we do our work, Altair, to ensure a future free of such things. But why do they need this piece of Eden? This apple, this treasure that Al Mulim guards so caringly in Masyaf Castle. What is this treasure? It is temptation. 
He who holds it commands the hearts and minds of whoever looks upon it. Out of the machine, Mr. Miles. Miss Stillman is once again insisting I let you rest. Desmond's time in the Animus has gleaned much, but nothing Abstergo did not already know. Lucy is continually worried about Desmond's prolonged exposure to this machine and Champion's regular breaks. Warren Vidich needs results from Desmond. Time for him and Abstergo are running out. Desmond is Abstergo's 17th subject. The subject that came before him, subject 16, he suffered. The eagle vision that Animus facilitated along with the genetic memories of his ancestors merged with his time outside of the Animus and gradually drove him insane. Lucy does not want this to happen to Desmond. That little fight your ancestors started during the Third Crusade, it never ended. You're being held by Templars. Abstergo is their company. The battle between the Assassins and Templars has been going on for centuries and is still going on. But at present, the balance has monumentally tipped in favour of the Templars and Abstergo's hold over the world is nearly complete. But just like almost a thousand years prior, they are looking for divine assistance. The artifact from Masayef, they had it. It was destroyed in the accident. Then what are they hoping for me? You know, for my ancestor to tell them. They're hoping he'll show them where the other ones are. You mean there's more than one of these things? With the apple destroyed in the present day, their plans were put on hold. But the apple in Masyaf may help them find more. In order to create their new world, they need the Peace of Eden to submit their philosophy. Order, Mr. Miles. The world needs order. That is what we're working towards, and that is what you're helping us to achieve. Your ancestors almost had the right idea, Mr. Miles. They didn't go far enough. There's no true change to be had without comprehensive, systemic intervention. Both the Assassin's and the Templar's goal is peace. Only the method is disputed by the Assassin's. I guess the best way to explain it is what they want is good, but the way they're going about it, it's bad. There are two more Templars who require your attention. What I do! I do for Acre! No! One in Acre, known as Sibran. Join them! One in Damas, called Jubair. Do any else among you wish to challenge me? What is the truth? We see the world the way it really is. What is the world, then? An illusion. One which we can either submit to, as most do, or transcend. Do you see now why the Templars are a threat? Whereas we would dispel the illusion, they would use it to rule. With eight men slain, only the Hydra's head remains, Robert de Saab. Like he has done for all his kills, Altair studied the land to get a bearing on how to bring down his final target. Word has it that Robert will be attending a funeral for Majdadin. He infiltrates, and de Saab is for the taking, but it's a trap. Guards descend, but Altair overcomes and gets his man. Except he doesn't, because it's not de Saab but a decoy, a woman named Maria. We knew you'd come. Robert needed to be sure he'd have time to get away. Altair spares her a decision he will one day be glad of. You must go to Al Mualim. There's no time. She told me where he's gone, what he plans. Robert de Sar's plan is to unite the warring factions, the Crusaders and the Saracens to a common aim to defeat the Assassins. Altair rides for Arsuf, fights his way through the armies to meet again with the Grand Master of the Knights Templar, Robert de Sar. Altair, this time, a changed man. A man that sees his world, himself, and his creed in truth and with humility. In contrast to their first meeting, Altair conquers, but in doing so, the inconceivable is revealed. He betrayed you, boy, just as he betrayed me. Nine men he sent you to kill, yes? It wasn't Nine who found the treasure assassin, but Ten. Give me his name. al Mualim. His heart knew what his mind would not tell him. Altair races back to Masyaf. He had been manipulated to do al Mualim's bidding all the time, placing the Holy Land in his hands. Now to control omnipotently. I said get up, goddammit! Listen! Oh no, they're coming for you. Assassins. Sounds like they're mounting some kind of rescue attempt. But whatever's going on down there has got nothing to do with me. Here, have a listen. That's been neutralized. The assassins out there have dwindled to almost nothing. They can't save Desmond, but there still exists one that can. The person that tipped the assassins off about where Desmond is. I am screwed, okay? What do you want me to do? Just try and have a little faith. 
Lucy has been protecting Desmond as best she can. She is a prisoner too, but what Abstergo don't know is that she's an assassin. But Abstergo are on the cusp of the information they need. Time is ticking. Altair arrives back to Masyaf Castle, now in Al Mualim's thrall. The will of the master must be obeyed. The Peace of Eden having captured the minds of all who exist in and around the castle walls. He moves to confront his master. No! What's happening? I found proof that nothing is true and everything is permitted. With the ability to bend minds, Al Mualim unleashes the spectres of the nine slain Templars for Altair to fight once more. You won't succeed. Others will find the strength to stand against you. And this is why so long as men maintain free will, there can be no peace. And you refuse to give up this evil scheme. It seems then we are at an impasse. No, we are at an end. Altair has been under the wing of Al-Mualim all his life, but his new reinforced understanding of the Creed compels him to not only end his master's existence, but the artifacts too. You held fire in your hand, old man. It should have been destroyed. Never. Then I will. We'll see about that. As Al-Mualim releases his grip on the apple, Abstergo gets the information they desire. The apple reveals a map. A map to all the remaining pieces of Eden. Destroy it! I can't. A thousand years from this moment, the hunt for just one of these divine artifacts begins. The upper management have what they want. Warren Vidic is relieved his task fulfilled. Lucy champions keeping Desmond alive for this next stage of Abstergo's plan. They leave. What the hell is that? The affliction that claimed the sanity of Subject 16 has reached Desmond. The bleeding effect has taken hold. Oh my god. And what happened to him? What does it mean, I wonder? To be continued. We have to go. Desmond Miles is an assassin, imprisoned, about to be freed. Freed from a prison named Abstergo. Abstergo is the corporate company with a sinister secret. It is a front for the Templar Order, an ancient organization hell-bent on power and control. Tools of their control and objects of their obsession are pieces of Eden. Artifacts that bend minds to the holder's will. Desmond, forced to help Abstergo find them using the Animus. A machine that taps into the user's lineage, a machine Abstergo are using to uncover secrets. They have the map to find more and need to be stopped. Luckily, Desmond has an ally. Lucy Stillman, an undercover assassin, is going to break him free. But before they escape to the assassin hideout, Desmond needs to synchronize with a new ancestor. An ancestor that will aid in their war against the Templars. What shall we call him, my love? Ezio. Ezio Auditore da Firenze. Florence, 1476. At the height of the Renaissance movement, a time of great cultural advancement, science, art, but also money and power. Ezio was born into this money and power, a member of the Auditore banking family, friends of the Medici. It was a carefree time for Ezio. He had a loving family, supportive friends, and a way with women. Life was good. They'd never change. But unbeknownst to Ezio, his life was about to be changed irreparably. The Auditores have enemies. Desmond and Lucy are free from Abstergo and safe in the assassin hideout in Rome. In Lucy's absence, Rebecca Crane, with help from Sean Hastings, has developed Animus 2.0. And with the Animus memory Lucy stole from Abstergo, Desmond is ready to be plugged back in, this time in cooperation and a cause of hope. We're losing this war, Desmond. We're going to train you, turn you into one of us. You broke me out of Abstergo and brought me here just to make me an assassin? Look, there's more to it than that, but it'll have to wait. Trust me. The assassins hope to use Ezio's life and learning to train Desmond in a matter of days, because days might be all they have. The Animus will facilitate this through 
the bleeding effect that has already afforded Desmond skills outside of the Animus, combat and eagle vision. But they must be careful. Too much exposure and Desmond could end up like others. Like Subject 16. All right, I'm in. Here we go. Ezio's father, Giovanni, was trained. Trained in banking and the head of the Medici Bank. But he was also trained in skills he used secretly. Kept secret from his children. Giovanni is an assassin, a member of the Italian order and currently investigating for Lorenzo de' Medici, ruler of Florence. Giovanni had uncovered a plot, a plot that had already seen the assassination of the Duke of Milan, a plot that looked to seize power across Italy. Giovanni fears Lorenzo and Florence was next. Giovanni already knew the mastermind of this conspiracy, Rodrigo Borgia, the head of the Templar Order. There were other names too. The only one he knew for sure, Francesco de Pazzi, head of the other powerful family in Florence. The Pazzi's jealous of the rise of the Medici's and resentful of the Auditore's involvement. Giovanni had the information to take them down, but with Lorenzo out of the city, the Templars took the opportunity to take down Giovanni, the man threatening to derail their plan. Ezio returns from running errands for his father. They took your father and brothers to the Palazzo della Signoria, to prison. Making sure his mother and sister were safe, Ezio climbed the prison tower under cover of night. Listen closely. Return to the house. In my office is a hidden door. Use your talent to find it. Beyond lies a chest. Take everything you find inside. Much of it may seem strange to you, but all of it is important. Unsure as to their significance, Ezio puts on the robes, sheathes the sword, takes the scroll, a strange device, and a letter. A letter he is instructed to take to Uberto Alberti, the Justice Minister, a friend of the Auditores, and their final hope to fix this. Ezio leaves his father's secret chamber. His world is rocked by the revelation that there is more to their father than they had known. It's a misunderstanding, Ezio. I'll clear everything up. I'll present these papers at their hearing in the morning, and they'll be released. Don't worry, Ezio. Everything is going to be fine. Except it won't. It will never be the same again because Alberto is not a friend. He is in league with Rodrigo Borgia and driven by his own need for revenge, Ezio's father and brothers are executed before his eyes. You may take our lives this day, but we will have yours in return, I swear we will! Father! There! Grab the boy! He's one of them! Ezio runs to escape the same fate and returns to the remaining auditores, his mother Maria and sister Claudia. They are kept in a bordello run by Paola. I can't stay. Why? Where are you going? To kill Uberto Alberti. You are not a killer, Ezio, but I can make you one. Little did he know, but this was the start of a lifetime of training, with a long line of strangers imparting their wisdom to fulfil Ezio's destiny to be an assassin. No small part of that is learning to blend into the crowd, to stay hidden in plain sight, to use distractions to reach guarded places and to use the hidden blade to make his kills. That was made possible by a local artist, engineer and family friend, Leonardo da Vinci, Molto onorato. who deciphered the strange scroll found with his father's things and used it to restore the hidden blade for Ezio's use. Incredible. And he used it on his first kill. Uberto Alberti. You! The auditorium are not dead! I'm still here! Me! Ezio! Ezio Auditore! Ezio has announced his revenge, not only that, but to find out why his father and brothers had to die. The Patsies are next on his list, but he must think of those that remain too. I think it's best I leave Firenze. My uncle Mario owns a villa near Monteregioni. To keep Maria and Claudia safe, they sneak out of the city and head for the place of their father's birth, Monteregioni. But as they arrive, their path is blocked by Vieri de Pazzi, the son of his father's conspirator, Francesco de Pazzi. What do you want, Vieri? Your life. Kill them! Kill them all! Ezio and his family are saved by his uncle, 
Mario Auditore, Vieri flees. Although Ezio looks to take his family much further, Mario persuades Ezio to stay and train for the dangerous tasks ahead, a task that is in his blood. Villa Monteregioni becomes their home, and although run down, it is an opportunity for them to salvage the auditory name. With Claudio's management and investment, it can be great again. In the coming months, Ezio would come to learn of his heritage, the history of the assassins and the work they were born to do. Part of that work was to collect and decipher codex pages, like the one hidden in his father's chest. Ancient writings scattered to time. On these pages, wisdom gathered by a legendary assassin, Altair ibn Lahad. Who long ago held a piece of Eden. He spoke of something powerful and ancient hidden beneath the land. And a prophecy the extent of which only more pages will reveal. And some of those are held by Templars also seeking this truth. Ezio joins Mario in search of their next target, Vieri de Pazzi. In doing so, Ezio overhears developments within the Templar plot. It's settled. Vieri, you will remain here to coordinate the mercenary. Francesco will organize our forces in the city and send word when it's time to strike. Jacopo, your job is to calm the citizens once the deed is done. A new name to the list, Jacopo de Pazzi, uncle to Francesco. Their plot to assassinate Lorenzo de' Medici and take control of Florence. The assassins must stop this. After the meeting, they close in on Vieri and end his life. Pezzo di merda! Vorrei solo che avesse sofferto di più! Spero che bru... Enough, Ezio! Show some respect. You are not Vieri. Do not become him. Ezio was not raised an assassin like his father and uncle. The mindset required will take time. Where will you go next? Firenze. Francesco de Pazzi will share the fate of his son. 1478. There, he meets more strangers to aid his path. You may call me La Volpe. At your service, Messer Ezio. Francesco di Pazzi is meeting his people inside that church. A meeting in which Ezio learns more of the plot. Where the assassination attempt will take place, when, and names of others involved in the Pazzi conspiracy. If they succeed. If we lose Lorenzo and Firenze falls to the Pazzi, it will not come to that. The Pazzi's end the life of Lorenzo's brother, but Ezio shepherds the ruler of Florence to safety. Francesco de Pazzi, help save our city, Auditore. Kill him. Now Firenze will judge you for what you've done. Requiescat in pace. With Francesco dead, Jacopo flees. Lorenzo has the remaining names of the Pazzi conspiracy, who may help track Jacopo down. Antonio Maffei. No grazie. Archbishop Francesco Salviati. Where is Jacopo? He knows you come for him. Stefano da Bagnone. They meet in the shadow of the Roman gods. And Bernardo Baroncelli. We gather at the church when a meeting is called. Ezio finds Jacopo at the church and follows him to the meeting in the shadow of the gods. Furious at the collapse of his plan to take over Florence, Rodrigo Borgia kills the last of the Pazzi conspirators and calls out the assassin that foiled his plans. Did you honestly think I wouldn't expect you to follow? We've been at this a lot longer than you. Kill him. With four years of training behind him, he escapes the trap, and with Florence saved, he heads for Venice to learn more of the next stage of the Templar plan and close in on those that took his father and brothers. Desmond needs to take a break. The bleeding effect, although useful, must be carefully managed. So, how am I doing? You've picked up every single one of Ezio's skills. The adoption rate is fantastic. Another day or two and we'll be done. But Desmond is hallucinating, accessing memories outside the animus of fate that befell Subject 16 before he died. But before he died, he left a message, hidden in the animus, brought over to 2.0. This message is broken up into fragments and scattered around Renaissance Italy. When whole, this message will be vital in understanding the origins of the pieces of Eden. Whilst reliving Ezio's memory, Desmond needs to collect these fragments. Venice, 
a city where trade is strangled and monopolized by the merchant Emilio Barbarigo, a member of the Templars and key to Borgia's plans in Venice. Ezio knows this is the next man on his list, but the palace in which he resides is too well protected and armed personnel too numerous. He will need help. Help arrives in the form of Antonio, Rosa, and their band of thieves. We know all about you, said Ezio. Your work in Florence and the rest of Tuscany. Good work, too, if a little unrefined. As Ezio helps break down Barbarigo's hold in the city, both Ezio and Desmond add more strings to their bow in becoming more rounded assassins. Your good work has restored us to our former strength, Ezio. We are ready to strike. Your little house of cards is crumbling, Emilio. Guard! Do not be afraid. I sought unity, stability, order. At too great a cost. Emilio is meeting with a man named Carlo. Carlo Grimaldi. He sits on the Council of Ten. I have a meeting to attend. That meeting is attended by Carlo, Rodrigo Borgia and three others. Those men are Silvio Barbarigo, cousin to Marco, and Marco's bodyguard, the loyal and dangerous Dante Moro. All of them Templars, looking to take control of Venice. After attempting to draw the current Doge of Venice to the Templar way of thinking failed, Carlo Grimaldi was to poison him, with Marco taking the seat of power. Another city, another plot, another building Ezio must infiltrate, but this time to save the Doge of Venice and the city from Templar hands. With Antonio's help, they recce the palace where the Doge resides. I must warn you. It's not going to be so easy this time. Palazzo Ducale is the most heavily guarded building in Venezia. Nothing is impenetrable. But not by traditional means. He needs the help of the genius inventor Leonardo and his yet untested flying machine. Like an eagle, Ezio descends on the roof of the palazzo to the rescue of the Doge. Stop! Signore, don't drink that! But he's too late. The Doge is poisoned. Ezio catches up with Carlo Grimaldi. With the Doge dead, the Templar plan is still on track as Marco Barbarigo takes his place. Ezio waits for his chance to unseat him and uses the Carnival as cover to do so. As Marco gives a speech to the reveling crowds, Ezio strikes. With Rodrigo Borgia away in Rome, Silvio and the bodyguard Dante are all that remain of the Templar plot in Venice. Silvio has amassed an army in the military district. In order to break that control, Ezio must have an army of his own. Bartolomeo d'Alviano is the man you seek. About goddamn time! He and his men have little love for Silvio. With his help, they storm the district. Now Silvio will see just how grave a mistake he's made. Ezio catches up with them both, fleeing towards a departing ship. Why the boats? I thought you saw the doge seat. Just a distraction. We were meant to sail. Sail where? I'll never tell. Cyprus is their destination. They want... They want... To find out what the Templar sought in Cyprus, Ezio would have to wait two years. Time for Ezio to find and decipher the remaining codex pages, and with the help of Leonardo, he revealed more of the prophecy. The prophet will appear when the second piece is brought to the floating city. A prophecy hidden in the codex, leading to an ancient vault that holds something very powerful. What if that's why they sent the ship to Cyprus? To find this piece of Eden. The killing of Mocenigo, even the Medici, my father and brothers. It was all part of his plan. To find the vault, the Spaniard. The Templar boat returns from Cyprus, carrying the piece of Eden. Ezio infiltrates, disguises himself, and joins the triumphant Templar soldiers, carrying the much longed for piece of Eden to the waiting Rodrigo Borgia. Where is he? Who? Your prophet. How many people have died for these? I am the prophet. Now give me the apple. Borgia guards descend, but to Ezio's surprise, so do his allies. All the people that have shaped him and helped smooth his path over the last ten years. Ten years of vengeance. These seemingly disconnected individuals come together to see off the Borgia soldiers and protect the apple. They do so 
but Rodrigo Borgia escapes. What are you all doing here? Perhaps the same thing you are, Ezio, hoping to see the Prophet appear. A Prophet's arrival was foretold. And unbeknownst to us, here you are. Perhaps all along, you were the one we sought. A new face for Ezio, but Niccolo Machiavelli will explain the tie that binds all these people, these friends. They are assassins. It's true, Nipote. We have all been guiding you for years, teaching you the skills you would need to join our ranks. That night, Ezio is officially inducted into the Brotherhood. We work in the dark to serve the light. We are assassins. Nothing is true. Everything is permitted. The apple is the assassin's possession, and more weight is added to the theory that Ezio is the prophet foretold as the apple reacts to his presence. This must never fall into the wrong hands. Ezio, you must protect this with all the skills we have taught you. They have the apple, but the Templar plot is still alive and well in the hands of Rodrigo Borgia and it will be another 10 years before the assassins are able to strike again. 10 years to source the remaining codex pages while locked in a seemingly perpetual struggle to keep hold of the apple, but keep hold of it, they do. 10 years later, with the apple in hand, the year is 1499. Rodrigo Borgia has extended his power throughout Italy and the world as he is now Pope, and for the assassins, the time has come. Let us finish what you and my father started all those years ago. Perhaps now we can finally make sense of this prophecy and put a stop to whatever it is the Spaniard is plotting. We should start by locating the vault. The Codex pages will lead us to it. When the pages are brought together with the apple, they reveal a map. A map that reveals the location of the vault. It exists in the Vatican City. It looks like the vault is in Roma. Then the Spaniard. This is why he became Pope. Not only did it give him the power to spread the Templar influence through Italy and the world, but it gave him access to the vault and to the papal staff. The Codex always spoke of two keys, two pieces of Eden needed to open the vault. Papal staff is the second piece of Eden. While the other assassins caused trouble in the city of Rome, Ezio uses the distraction to infiltrate the Vatican during Rodrigo Borgia's papal sermon to the Cardinals in the Sistine Chapel. Requiescat in pace, you bastard! I don't think so! How is it you resist? I see. Kind of you to bring me the apple. You will give it to me. As you wish. The two battle, both imbued with the power of the piece of Eden they possess. But Rodrigo, more familiar with the artifact's power, overcomes Ezio. And now, to deal with you. He now has both pieces of Eden and the location of the vault. His decades of work has reached its conclusion. He heads towards his perceived destiny. Ezio, injured but able to stand, uses his skills to pursue Rodrigo. Open, damn you! Open! It's over, Rodrigo. Get it over with, then. No. Killing you won't bring my family back. Ezio elects to spare the false prophet Rodrigo, and on touching the staff paired with the apple, the vault door opens, allowing the prophet to enter. Greetings, prophet. It is good you have come. Let us see it, to give thanks. The hologram that Ezio faces is... Minerva. You are... gods. No, not gods. We simply came before. Minerva is a projection from an advanced intelligence that existed before man. In fact, they created man. Man did not evolve. This was a fact fabricated by the Templars to protect the secrets they wished to take advantage of. The ones that came before made humans as slaves, but the oppressed rose and overcame their masters. Shortly after that, a celestial event occurred that wiped out almost all life. Those that remained 
from both sides work together to rebuild. Even when we walked the world, your kind struggled to understand our existence. You may not comprehend us, but you will comprehend our warning. Our words are not meant for you. I do not wish to speak with you, but through you. You are the prophet. You've played your part. The person Minerva was to commune with is Desmond. Through the Animus to deliver a message, to warn of the coming of another celestial event, an event that could literally shake the world to its core, taking some, if not all, of humanity with it. The ones that came before have now died out, but what they left behind was vaults like these, temples, within them the wisdom to help humanity stop the catastrophe from ever happening again. Desmond is chosen as the one to bring this about. You must find the other temples. If you can find them, if their work can be saved, so too might this world. Be quick, for time grows short, and guard against the cross, for there are many who will stand in your way. We are gone now from this world, all of us. We can do no more. The rest is up to you, Desmond. What the fuck? Desmond has an importance far greater than the assassins, the Templars, even himself had imagined. But there is no time for Desmond to reflect on this. The Templars have found the assassins' hideout. Among them, Warren Vidich, Desmond's former captor and the man in charge of Abstergo's Animus Project. Mr. Miles. This is an unexpectedly pleasant turn of events. What do you want, Vidic? There's still so much work for us to do together. As the Abstergo men look to take Desmond back, he puts all the skills he has learned through Ezio by the Animus to the test and sees off the threat. Enjoy your victory, Mr. Miles. Temporary as it is. With the hideout compromised, this team of assassins need to move on move on to continue their work. The rest is up to you, Desmond. What? Ezio, in the vault below the Vatican in 1499, was left astounded and confused in equal measure. Please wait, there's so many questions. Desmond, in the animus at their Rome hideout in 2012, feels much the same. Uh, Rebecca, what's going on? I have to run some diagnostics, I'll get back to you. But Abstergo, the Templars have caught up with the assassins. Desmond and his fellow assassins are on the run once more. The organization the assassins have been battling for millennia are winning. Their numbers have dwindled to almost nothing. They still have teams based around the world, but many are dead or missing in action. Those that remain are trying their best to stifle Abstergo's search for other pieces of Eden, the ancient tools of control created by an ancient civilization. Abstergo need just one of them for a special project, a satellite launch that will further strengthen their control over the world and its people. The assassins in Italy need to source a location Abstergo won't easily find them. They gravitate to a place of great importance to Desmond's ancestor Ezio, the Auditore Villa in Monteregioni, Tuscany. Both Ezio and Desmond are in the dark about many things, but they do know this. Minerva, a hologram from a race long dead, delivered a clear message. A celestial event is on its way. Not in Ezio's time, but perhaps in Desmond's. It is up to him. But where does he start? He has his fellow assassins to assist him. Rebecca Crane in charge of running the Animus. Sean Hastings, historian and analyst. And overseeing everyone. Lucy Stillman. In the Vatican, Minerva talked about other temples, that they're the key to preventing whatever terrible thing is about to happen to the Earth. But where are these temples? To find the temples, I'm convinced we need to get our hands on Ezio's Apple of Eden. Minerva altered it somehow when she touched it. Despite being underdogs, the assassins have one advantage. Abstergo do not know about the temples, and they don't know about Ezio's Apple. The other piece of Eden, the Papal Star, used to open the vault under the Vatican, was reclaimed by it, safe from man. 
but Ezio has the apple. He may not understand all the words of Minerva, but he understands the power of the apple. He needs to keep it out of the hands of man, out of the hands of the Templars. The search for the temples, and perhaps the tools to combat the impending celestial event is the main priority for Desmond and his assassins. For Ezio and his assassins, there are more immediate matters. Ezio and his uncle Mario Auditore flee the Vatican. Ezio, for now, entrusts the apple to Mario, and they leave Rome to return to the Auditore Villa in Monteregione. This place just keeps getting better. Since arriving at Monteregione all those years ago, after losing his father and brothers to the Templars, Ezio and his sister Claudia have renovated and rejuvenated the town beyond Mario's expectations. And Mario has been an important mentor to his nephew, and Ezio has become a vital custodian and hero of the town. Look, it is Ezio! Buongiorno! Salve, Mario! It's good to be home! It is their home their family home, a place of safety and the meeting place of the Assassin Brotherhood. An organisation the Auditore family have long since been a part. Not all the Assassins are here today. Paola is back in Florence, Teodora and Antonio are in Venice. The Templar threat has been quashed there, but these cities need an Assassin's presence to guard against their return. Bartolomeo and La Volpe are in Rome. The remaining assassins and close allies meet here today to discuss the incredible events that transpired at the Vatican. Ezio regales them of tales of Minerva, the ancient civilization, the temples, and that mysterious name, Desmond. Amazing. I cannot imagine such wonders. And Ezio informs them of the mercy he bestowed on Rodrigo Borgia, leaving him injured to his own fate after their battle. Mercy, a trait hard-earned over the years, since his early need to indulge his anger and seek revenge on those that killed his family. The Spaniard lives! The assassin Niccolo Machiavelli is shocked at Ezio's decision not to end the threat of the Borgia when he had the chance. Once our enemies are dead, we can speak of vaults and gods and ancient places. The assassins know that they need to investigate Minerva's message further, but for now, the Order has a more imminent threat the Borgia's hold on Italy. The assassins disband to consider their plight. Machiavelli, disappointed, heads to Rome. And Ezio catches up with an old friend, a friend of the assassins, the Countess of Forli, Caterina Sforza. Shh. What's that? Probably just training exercises. Monteregione, the cherished home of the Auditore family, was being laid waste by the Borgia Pope's papal army. Do you have it? I am keeping it safe. We need to hold them off until the townspeople have escaped. With the apple still safe, they wish each other luck and Mario leaves to meet the attack head on, while Ezio looks to protect the walls. Uncle, be careful. I will. As half a life's work crumbles around him, Ezio knows the town is lost but they can save its people. Ezio mans the cannons to stem the Borgia attack. As the last of their people escape, the gates are breached. I know you're there, Ezio! The Pope told me about you and your little group of assassins. Andres! So consider this an invitation from my family to yours! His family is Borgia. His father is the Pope and he is the leader of his papal army. His name is Cesare Borgia. And he has the apple. He has Katrina Sforza prisoner. And his uncle, his mentor, his adopted father Mario, is killed. He has no time to process this yet. He must see that all have escaped, including his last remaining relatives his mother and sister. Although wounded, he fights his way to the villa. Stop! Wait for us! Where does this passage lead? To the north. Let me through. I must go help the troops. The door closes on an escape route through the assassin's tomb, the shrine to the great assassins that came before him. They exit the walls. Mario is dead. Take mother to Firenze. You are not coming with us. Where are you riding? To Roma. Go, my son. Destroy them. 
But remember for whom we assassins fight. With revenge in his heart once more, he heads to Rome, the seat of Borgia power. To not only finish what he started with the Borgia Pope, but to end the life of his son Cesare and claim back the apple. They must be eradicated for the good of the people and to avenge his uncle Mario. But the injury he suffered will prevent this for now. The assassins in 2012 are on the run from Abstergo once more. They arrive to the only place they know they'll be safe for now. It's our last safe house in Italy. The Auditore Villa in Monteregione. Abstergo upgraded his cell towers ages ago. The waves go through everything above ground. The assassins' tomb, the sanctuary deep underground will be their new home. Should be safe to set up. Let's get the Animus down there. Desmond's bleeding effect is still producing images from the past. He sees Ezio in the sanctuary, not as he was when he fled the villa, but older, calmer. The vision subsides as they all do. The bleeding effect is a byproduct of the animus. The more time Desmond spends within it, the more frequent the visions. These visions need to be monitored. They could drive him insane, kill him even, like they did Subject 16. The tomb has been forgotten for centuries, but it looks just as it did through the Animus, except for one detail. A series of triangles at the secret entrance, which when looked at through eagle vision, produce a set of numbers. 1419, 1420, and 1421. Looks like something Ezio left behind. What could it mean? But they don't have time to consider it. They need to get Desmond in the Animus in search of the Peace of Eden. It's the only lead they have on finding the temples that could hold the key to preventing the end of humanity. As soon as we find the apple, I get in contact with our other teams in Europe, but as far as Italy goes, we're on our own. Now get in there and find the apple. Let's get started. Ezio awakens, still injured from his brush with the Borgia. Where have you brought me? You are to meet Messer Machiavelli in front of the Mausoleo di Augusto. He was found injured and brought to Rome, cared for and clothed in assassin's robes. He still has his blade and his experience, but his worldly possessions, everything he has collected on his quest since he was 17, his money, his codex weapons, they're gone. It has been 23 years since he lost his father and brothers to the Templars. He is now 40 years of age. It's the year 1500. Rome is under complete Borgia control, Templar control. The papal soldiers patrol the streets, stifling freedom. Punishment is harsh, trade is suffocating. The Borgia have an arrangement with gangs like the Cento Occhi, the Hundred Eyes, who do the dirty work when needed, and potent threats like the cult of Romulus that inhabit underground lairs lost to time emerging to drive people back into the clutches of the church with their terror and savagery. The Borgia have the people of Rome in their control and there is no escape. Still broken from his injuries, Ezio meets his fellow assassin, Machiavelli. With his knowledge of the city and its powers, he sets Ezio on the right path. The good news is that the Borgia think Ezio is dead. He can work from the shadows once more, an advantage they sorely need. For the adversary they now face, Cesare Borgia will be near unassailable. He is ambitious, ruthless, and cruel beyond imagining. His ambition had him kill his brother for power. His ruthlessness meant many were sent to the gallows and his cruelty, when not carried out by Cesare himself, is outsourced to his attack dog, Nicoletto who never flinches to enact his sadistic will. Cesare has set his sights on all of Italia, and at this rate he will have it. Rodrigo Borgia's death would not have solved anything. I am inclined to disagree. Killing one man will not change things. We need to take away the source of their power. Machiavelli is still bitter that Ezio spared Rodrigo. Their task is even harder because of it. They need to undermine their rule here in Rome, the epicenter of the regime's power. Ezio can take down the Borgia captains who govern the various districts in the city. Once chased out, let the people in the area know that the Borgia are defeated by burning their flags and symbols of rule. Then give them back their freedom by helping them reopen commerce, an opportunity to earn, to show them that the Borgia does not own them. Rome is for the people. The Borgia grip will take time to erode. In the meantime, Ezio needs help eyes and ears to gain intel on how to free his friend Katerina Sforza, locate the whereabouts of the apple, and how to find and take down enemy number one, Cesare Borgia. 
Machiavelli shows Ezio a hideout they can use as their new assassin headquarters. It is given to them by Fabio Orsini. Fabio is a member of the Borgia Papal Forces. I've heard a great deal about you from my cousin, Bartolomeo Dalviano. A fine warrior. Fabio sides with the assassins intellectually, but he's bound to Cesare for now, but he wants to break free. His help here by offering this storeroom and help yet to come will be invaluable to the assassins. It is perfect. The headquarters is an area to regroup, store equipment, converse with fellow assassins and make plans for their quests. Machiavelli reminds Ezio of three factions that can aid them, but they are currently all occupied by their own trials. Fabio's cousin and Ezio's friend Bartolomeo Dalviano runs the muscle that usually help their cause, but... Our mercenaries are ensnared in a losing battle with Cesare's French allies. The courtesans have always proved incredibly useful to the assassins, and will do now, as they often entertain cardinals of the Borgia Church. But the madam there is lazy, and would rather attend parties than further our cause. And the thieves are run by the familiar, but elusive, La Volpe. But they refuse to talk to us. I don't know why. What are you going to do? Make some friends. In order to get the Allies focused on the same outcome, Ezio must smooth their path. Ezio Auditore! <laughs> Bartolomeo is being attacked on both sides by the Borgia army and their allies, the French. If they can defeat one, they can focus all their efforts on the other. Ezio helps topple the Borgia hierarchy in the area, allowing their concentration on the French. We send those luridi codardi running for the hills! The mercenaries can breathe for now. Welcome to the Rosa in Fiore, stranger. This is the home of the courtesans. Ezio is there to see the Madonna Solari, to persuade her to focus on the assassin's cause. Aiuto, aiuto! Madonna Solari! But she has been taken. But by who? Slave traders, Messere. They want coin in exchange for her life. The Cento Occhi clearly working for the Borgia. Ezio, keen to end the matter, elects to pay them. I have your money. Let her go! No! Take it up with Cesare! <laughs> Ezio intends to, and after seeing off the gang members, heads back to the Rosa, only to find the last people you would ever wish to find at a brothel. Mother? Sister? Ezio, Sir Machiavelli said that you might be here. What are you doing in Roma? Ezio, we want to help. I was trying to help you by sending you to Firenze. Ezio needs his family safe. He can't lose any more to his enemies. Where is Madonna Solari? She's dead. Merda. Ezio needs the Rosa to stay in business. He needs the intel they will glean from the sinning cardinals. Without someone who can run things, we're finished. I'll do it. You do not belong here, Claudia. I know how to run a business. She does. Claudia was instrumental in the revitalization of Monteriggioni, and she wants to help here. She knows the importance of the assassin's work and feels drawn to its purpose just like Ezio. You do this, Claudia, and you are on your own. I've been on my own for 20 years. Due to his cause and Claudia's focus on the villa, they have been estranged, and this impasse regarding the Rosa further drives a wedge between them. Resigned and conflicted, Ezio heads to see La Volpe to find out why communication has broken down between the thieves and the assassins. It turns out it is due to mistrust of one of the order. That man is a traitor to our order. Machiavelli has been an ambassador to the papal court and a friend and confidant to Cesare Borgia himself. Ezio is convinced this is Machiavelli's nature to gain information any way possible. La Volpe believes he is compromising the assassins. They need to find out his real purpose. La Volpe spies report a meeting between Machiavelli and a Borgia soldier. What do you make of that? With the passing of documents to Machiavelli, this casts further doubt on his character, but Ezio still remains convinced. I know what we saw, but you have nothing to fear from Machiavelli. If you believe Machiavelli remains loyal to the Order, I trust you. La Volpe's suspicions are calmed for now, and with the help of his thieves, Ezio now has all the allies by his side once more. Ezio oversees the development of the premises of each guild, and in return, 
Each will aid Ezio and the assassins in their quests. The Volpe and his spies will search for the apple. My spies tell me that the apple has been secreted to someone for a study. I am working on determining his identity. Claudia and her courtesans will find where Caterina Sforza is being held. Caterina will be moved to the prison within the Castello next week. Bartolomeo will find the location of enemy number one. Cesare Borgia. That bastardo Cesare is in the Castel Sant'Angelo with the Pope. Able to kill two birds with one stone, Ezio awaits outside the Castello Sant'Angelo for the arrival of the shackled Caterina Sforza. Who put you up to this? Was it your brother or your father? Perhaps a bit of both? Perhaps at the same time? Chiudi la bocca! None speak ill of the Borgia! Overseeing the prisoner is another Borgia, more beautiful but no less cruel, Rodrigo's daughter, Cesare's sister, Lucrezia Borgia. Ezio infiltrates the Castello just in time to overhear Cesare meeting his captains and conspirators. Forget the Pope, you only answer to me. Seeing them together, Ezio is transported to the moment the villa walls were breached, the moment his uncle was taken. Lucrezia, these men, all flanked Cesare as his town and uncle were taken. One is Octavian de Valois, general of the French allies currently locked in battle with Bartolomeo's men. His right-hand man, the dangerous Micheletto. The third, dressed in cardinal's robes, is as yet unknown to Ezio. What of Il Vaticano? That tired old man's club. Play along for now, but soon we will have no need of them. Ezio continues on as this information sinks in. Rodrigo and his son may want the same things, but it seems by different means. They are not working together and Cesare wants power, the reins of Italy to himself, not hampered or overshadowed by his father. Further on, Ezio witnesses the unconventional bond between the Borgia siblings. Lucrezia, have you talked to the Pope about the funds requested by my banker? He is away from the Castello and he might need some convincing when he returns. That shouldn't be a problem, should it? Once I have secured the throne of Italia, you are going to be my queen. Cesare leaves the Castello before Ezio has a chance to get near. The Pope, contrary to the assassin intel, is nowhere to be seen. This is strange, but Ezio can still aid Caterina. Ah! That puts you in your place. Lock it and give me the key. Ezio must get that key. My fight is not with you, Lucrezia. Free Caterina, and I will stand down. Impossible. Then you leave me no choice. <coughs> Rescuing princesses from castles now? Ezio drags Lucrezia kicking and screaming to the cell of Katrina. Katrina knowing where the key is to free herself. Guards! Guards! <coughs> That's enough out of you! They flee, battling the papal soldiers, and return to the assassin hideout to convalesce and regroup. Cesare has left Rome to fight his conquests in Italy at large. They won't be able to get close to him at present. All they can do is further destabilize the Borgia grip on Rome. They can do this by bringing others to their cause. To win this war, Machiavelli, we need loyal soldiers. By recruiting enemies of the state, we arm those who have been disarmed by the Borgia. Ezio aids Borgia's enemies. The liberation of Roma has begun. Your cause is also mine. My life is at your service. With each person they recruit, they contribute to their chance of overthrowing the Borgia. Ezio is building and growing their brotherhood. Katrina leaves to her besieged hometown of Forli with these parting words. You are the leader of the assassins now. Unite them, Ezio Adipore, and take back Roma. He aims to do so. And while scouring the city for candidates to their cause, he encounters an old friend. Over here. The artist, inventor, and genius that deciphered the codex, Leonardo da Vinci. Come here. Leonardo has been coerced into helping the Borgia. They would have killed me had I refused. What do they want? War machines. Cesare intends to supply his army with my creations. The assassins cannot afford to miss an opportunity to weaken Cesare's ever-growing army. He will need to track down Leonardo's inventions, sabotage them, and destroy the plans. Their force will be too strong otherwise. Leonardo has other news. News of the apple. Cesare left it in my hands to study. Then Rodrigo took it from me. I know not where. The Pope has the apple once more. They must get to him, but he is locked away deep in the Castello. 
They must also help Bartolomeo tackle the French army headed by de Valois, and they must also lure Cesare back to the city. For this, Ezio has a plan. If we cut off his funds, Cesare will lose his army and return without his men. Where does he get his money? All we know is that he is called the banker. To find out the identity of the banker, Ezio needs to track the money. He tracks down the guards responsible for transporting the coin, takes the disguise of one of their number and gains access to a party thrown by the banker. Ezio has seen him before, in the company of Cesare Borgia at the Castello and the gates of Monteregione. His name is Juan Borgia, cousin to Cesare. Cesare is about to speak in the main room, Eccellenza. This is too good to be true, and also with his father. Cesare should be elsewhere, in Italy, fighting. Soon! We will be here once more, celebrating a united Italia. And then the feasting will last for 40 days and 40 nights. Cesare's speech highlights the dissension that Cesare increasingly displays to his father. We did not agree to conquer Italia. Rodrigo is not the same man since his defeat at the hands of Ezio. His spirit is broken and he's 70 now. The years have caught up with him but he has never taken his sights from the aims of his Templar order. Cesare, it seems, dreams of power and the role of Grand Master Templar for himself. He's not content to work with subtlety. He yearns to be followed. He yearns to be feared. You risk upsetting the delicate balance of control we have worked so hard to tighten. I have the army, so I am making the decisions. Don't look so glum. Enjoy yourself. Rodrigo's papal power is being eclipsed by the ambitions of his son. Borgia, father and son are unreachable now, but nephew and cousin Juan Borgia is in sight and must be killed. His financial acumen is integral to the might of Cesare's forces. The things I have felt, seen and tasted, I do not regret a moment of it. Juan has attended his last party and the money meant for Cesare is appropriated by the courtesans. In order to put the squeeze on Cesare even more, the assassins must defeat his allies the French, and the need to act has become even more acute, as their general, Baron de Valois, has kidnapped Bartolomeo's wife, Pantasilea, and demands his surrender. Enter my camp unarmed at dawn. I'll kill you for tutto francese! Bartolomeo is enraged to attack, but Ezio persuades him towards calm. They steal uniforms of the French, and with Bartolomeo in chains, they infiltrate the Baron's camp. Why don't you grow up here and release my wife? You savages never learn. While the disguised mercenaries attack, Ezio finds the Baron and ends his life. Requiescat in pace. With the French defeated and Pantasilea returned, the assassins have done all they can to weaken Cesare's army. They must now focus on defeating the Borgia and getting back the apple. The apple is not only important to Ezio, it is vital to the assassins in modern day Monteriggioni. It's their only lead to the temples. If Ezio can keep his hand on the apple, they will hopefully be able to find out where it is kept. The Templars Abstergo, they think, are unaware of the temples or the impending catastrophe, but they have a mission of their own at the moment. Our top assassins are busy gathering info about the Templar satellite launch. The Templars' methods of control are beginning to lose their grip. Capitalism is being questioned and attempts to control through the TV network are starting to show signs of resistance. They need a new method and their satellite launch could be the ultimate solution. With a satellite built around a piece of Eden, they can amplify its signal to bend the entire world to their will. How long do we have before the Templar satellite launch? It's October 8th, so that leaves us with 74 days. Think about all that you've been through in the last month. 74 days is a long time. If it were up to me, you'd take more breaks. The bleeding effect so far has been good to Desmond. It's taught his body and mind outside of the Animus to do what Ezio can, fight, move, to be an expert assassin, but exposure can hurt, and Lucy is worried. She saw firsthand what it did to Subject 16, the mania it caused, his suicide, the only way he had to silence the ancestral voices in his head. But Subject 16 was lucid enough to leave clues for his fellow assassins in the Animus. They could be found across Italy by Ezio, and they produced a video that revealed the origin of humanity and our makers 
the ones that came before. It showed Adam and Eve escaping with the apple from slavery, the start of freedom and independence for humanity. Subject 16 did the same in Rome. Ezio tracked down these glyphs that revealed puzzles and information and secret documents on the rise and methods of control that the Templars used over the years, all leading to snippets of video. When collected, this did not reveal a video in full at all, but a program within the Animus, a world within a world. Desmond navigates the space which leads to a computerized form claiming to be Subject 16. You're dead. I saw your blood. No time. It is far later than you know. Subject 16's insanity is well documented, but Desmond takes his words on board with amazement. She is not who you think she is. Who isn't? He also talks of Eden and finding Eve. The key, her DNA. Is he talking of the woman who skated with the apple all those centuries ago? That Eve? I am with you till the end. Find me in the darkness. He can't be alive, but who was that? Does his ramblings mean anything? Not that Desmond can discern right now. He is reminded of the dangers of the Animus, but he must continue to find the apple. He owes it to Lucy, the team, the world. Weren't you the only assassin at Abstergo's Animus facility? How are you getting data from them? Some old passwords work, but I can't dig very far into the network. The assassins have their focus and all the intel they need. I'll rest once we have the apple. The apple lies well guarded behind the walls of the Castello in Rodrigo's hands, and Cesare will head there to seek support from the Pope for his ailing army. But their quarters in the Castello are highly secure. La Volpe may have the solution. There is a side entrance. Lucrezia's latest plaything, Pietro, has a key. La Volpe's spies will track him down. In private, La Volpe's suspicions of Machiavelli are re-emerging. As information has arisen regarding Ezio's last visit to the Castello. Someone warned Rodrigo to stay away from the Castello. And the Borgia have been alerted as to the location of La Volpe's spies. We must not be split apart by mere suspicion. Despite the mounting evidence, Ezio cannot bring himself to condemn Machiavelli yet. He moves with La Volpe to rescue his vulnerable spies and in doing so sees a familiar face. One he has not seen since that fateful day at the villa. Momento! You were at the Villa Auditore during the attack! He gives chase. Why did you run? I... You are the traitor, not Machiavelli. Long live the Borgia! The integrity of the assassins assured for now, Ezio and the thieves having found Pietro retrieve the key to the side entrance of the Castello. The assassins have the strength and means to finish this. This strength in unity has reminded Ezio of the importance of family. Call the assassins together and bring Claudia. Despite Ezio's anger at Claudia's insistence on running the Rosa in Fiore, her work has been integral to the strength of the assassins. He is proud of her, and their coldness towards each other must end. Mario, our father, and our brother, once stood around this fire. Now, I offer the choice to you. Join us. He inducts her officially into the order, and whilst doing so, Machiavelli looks to recognize Ezio's importance. You have led the charge against the Templars and rebuilt this brotherhood. Now we must put Ezio where he belongs, at the head of the assassins. The seat Mario left needed to be filled, and with that, his nephew Ezio is now mentor of the Italian Brotherhood. His first act will be to end the Borgia control and retrieve the apple. Ezio gets there in time to see Cesare arrive at the Castello. I want to see the Pope! He uses the key to the side entrance and heads to the Pope's apartments. My funds! My troops! Gone! The Pope and his son's relationship is broken down, and Cesare's actions threaten all that the Templar have worked for. Rodrigo, with Cantarella-laced apples, looks to end Cesare's life. I gave you everything, and yet it's never enough. Cesare! He intends to poison you! If I want to live, I live. If I want to take, I take. If I want you to die, you die! Where is the piece of Eden? Stop! I know where it is! And you did not tell me he had taken it? Despite Lucrezia siding with her brother, her loyalty is not returned. It's me, your queen. You are my sister, 
Nothing more. Where is the apple? Cesare, sickened but not killed by the poison, leaves armed with the apple's location. Ezio must learn of it too. Rodrigo is dead. Not at the hands of Ezio, but of his own kin. His influence created a den of vipers, and they both came back to bite him. Requiescat in pace. I know where that bastard is going. San Pietro, the pavilion in the courtyard. <coughs> Ezio beats Cesare to St. Peter's and uses his gift to find where the apple is hidden. Looking for this. It ends now, assassino. My sword will take your life. But with the poison still running through his veins, he must retreat. Ezio uses the power of the apple to escape the Vatican and its papal guards and returns to the assassin hideout. Rodrigo Borgia is dead. And Cesare? Poison, but alive. We must not allow him to assemble his remaining supporters. With your aid, I will hunt him down. Over the coming weeks, Cesare stalls for time as he awaits the arrival of Micheletto and his army. And then you will see how quickly the Assassini fall. You delude yourself, Cesare. Ezio uses the apple to put an end to the papal forces in Rome. With his power depleted, he also loses Templar control of the Vatican as they elect another pope not bound to their cause. Julius II. Roma is not the same as it once was. Borgia Mani has become tainted. You will regret this decision! The assassins have their apple, but Cesare still eludes them. It is nearly two years before they next get their chance. In that time, the tables in the city had turned. It was the Templars that needed to hide in the shadows. The Brotherhood receive intel that he is waiting at the gates for his forces to take Rome back. Gather the assassins. We face him together. Soon, Micheletto and his army will arrive, but you shall be dead before then. Vittoria and Assassini! Using the apple, they are able to overcome Cesare's men, but it might be too late. With the arrival of Micheletto's forces, even the apple might not be enough to overcome their sheer numbers. We will take back my city once and for all! Except, it's not Micheletto. His army has not arrived. It is a familiar face to the assassins. Bartolomeo's cousin, Fabio Orsini. By order of Pope Julius II, I arrest you, Cesare Borgia. No! No! This is not how it ends! Chains will not hold me! I will not die by the hand of man! Cesare is captured. For now, the assassins can rest. They have the apple. The Borgia are defeated. But something troubles Ezio. It was the manner in which he said it. Chains will not hold me. If you are so worried, there is a way to find out. Despite his fear of the apple, he knows that it will contain the answers he seeks. As the visions bombard him, he immediately understands why Cesare was confident that he would rise again. He knew he had help. Cesare was right. I have to leave. What do you intend to do? Plant a seed. What Ezio saw through the apple was that Cesare's right-hand man, Micheletto, would free him from his imprisonment. He would regain his strength and his men, and he would continue in his lust for power. Ezio also understood when and where they would meet again. It would be four years later, on a battlefield in Spain. But in the interim, he needs to give a safe home to the apple. Neither he nor any man should have access to it now. 1507. The Spanish lands of Viana, Ezio finally catches up with Cesare. How did you find me? The apple you stole from Mario Auditore, let me hear. He fights his way through the battlefield, through the conflict between the Borgia army and the army of Louis de Beaumont. Ezio cares not about the outcome of this conflict. It's not his fight. He only cares about getting his man. He finally meets him on the walls of Castle Viana. Come then, Ezio! The throne was mine! Wanting something does not make it your right. No man can murder me! Then I leave you in the hands of fate. And gravity. As Cesare is thrown from the castle walls, the Templar Grand Master is defeated and the work of the Italian Order of the Assassins is completed for now. Ezio will have other fights, other roles to play in their fight against the Templars, but for now, our hero can rest. 
The assassins in modern-day Monteriggione now have the location of the apple, in Rome, under the Colosseum. Ezio already knew the location of the vault before the apple told him how to access it. He came across it in his aim to flush out the cult of Romulus from their lairs and seek their treasure, but he did not have the means to enter them. But, in speaking to the apple, it gave him the password needed in order to open the vault, leaving the apple safe within it, and to plant a clue for those in the future with his gifts to gain access. He leaves that clue in the form of a triangle, in the assassin's tomb in Monteregioni. The symbol matches the one on the door to the vault. Eagle Vision reveals those numbers. 1419, 1420, 1421. A riddle. Oh my god. A riddle that Sean divines. The Tetragrammaton, the 72 names of God. If you arrange the four Hebrew letters in God's name within an equilateral triangle, their numerical values add up to the same number. 72. I think we have our password. The assassins leave the safety of the underground sanctuary and head to Rome, to the Colosseum. If they can get their hands on the apple, they may be able to find the temples. 72 is their password. When spoken, we'll get them into the vault, and by coincidence or design, there is also 72 days left until the Abstergo satellite launch. Desmond takes the more difficult but known path. The others look for another route. Their paths are to converge at the Basilica di Santa Maria. Now, supposedly, this church was built on top of the ancient temple of Juno. Indeed, as Ezio progressed towards the Basilica, he uses his eagle vision to open doors blocking his path. In doing so, he meets a hologram, just like that of Minerva. This one is named Juno, and she is one that came before. We commit to this space the epilogue of our ending. Let it be found by he who is deemed worthy. Let it shape his path forward. Let it save the world we leave behind. As Desmond continues to forge a path to the vault, Juno speaks of the previous cataclysm and her efforts to preserve her kind after the disaster, as well as the human race. They left their story and wisdom to the materials and minds of men. But these proved impermanent and were lost to time and left the world ignorant. The ones who came before did not build humanity to be wise, but now the hope of the world rests upon one of them. Desmond. Humanity has the ability to understand, but they used their tools for control, rather than understanding and use them against one another. The ones that came before destroyed what they could, and sealed away what they could not, in vaults and temples. They could save their wisdom, but not themselves. Time took them in the end. Humans could never understand that of Juno's people because they didn't have their sixth sense. They call it knowledge. Some assassins have the beginnings of it, like Desmond and Ezio, because they are children of two worlds. Skills passed on genetically through the union between the two races. But those with human blood could only use some of the eagle vision, not all. The assassins with mixed blood, the ones with that gift, are all that remains of the ones that came before. Maybe that's why they look to store such knowledge, away in places only assassins could access, so that their race could live on. By coming to this temple, it is Juno's hope that Desmond will activate this knowledge to its full. He will have the knowledge, but according to Juno, it will be too late. Desmond activates a plinth that reacts to his touch and leads them to the vault door. The password, when spoken, 72, opens the vault. Time to find out where those temples are. Desmond reaches the apple, the prize they've been seeking all this time. As he approaches, it bursts into an array of symbols. That, that's a Phrygian cap. It stands for, for freedom. And that, that's a Masonic eye. Now those two come together in only one place. What's happening? Sean cannot finish because Desmond touches the apple and the assassins freeze still. What's keeping them frozen like this? I can't move. Your DNA communes with the apple. You have activated it. Let me go! On the 72nd day before the moment of awakening, you, birthed from our loins, the final journey commences. Also, she speaks of one that must accompany Desmond through the gate, one he does not know yet. Who is this person? The path must be opened. The scales shall be balanced. As Juno speaks, Desmond is controlled by the apple, becomes its pawn, controlled to move his feet towards its will. It bears his blade and takes aim at his friend, his ally, the person he trusts most, Lucy Stillman. No! 
It is done. The way lies all before you. Only she remains to be found. Awaken the sixth. Go alone. Through the apple, this ancient civilization have enacted their plan. The trauma of this overwhelms Desmond. He is lost to this world. He has killed his friend. Why? Juno talks of another he must find. Is it Eve, as Subject 16 mentioned? If Juno is correct, Desmond is destined to awaken his sixth sense, to develop his gift to that of his ancestors, the ones that came before. Before his consciousness is lost completely, Desmond hears voices. One of them is a voice familiar to him, one he has not heard in a long time. Shit, he's gone into shock. Put him back in the machine. It's the only way to fix this. But the Animus did this to him. Am I the expert or not? As he passes into black, he remembers the words of Subject 16, spoken in the program he built. I am with you till the end. Find me in the darkness. Many questions remain unanswered. Will the apple show the way to the temples? Why did the apple require Lucy's death? Who is the voice so familiar to Desmond? And most pressing, will Desmond wake from this trauma? We look to Revelations next for answers. Desmond Miles returns to consciousness in a strange place. It appears coastal, but it's not of his world. But he still remembers. He remembers approaching the apple hidden by Ezio beneath Rome. Him being compelled to move towards his friend, Lucy Stillman, the person he trusted most. No! His hidden blade piercing her skin. It is done. She must be dead. He used this blade many times as Altair, as Ezio, but why? Why had the apple made him do it? Why had Juno? You know very little. We must guide you. He also remembers that voice. A voice he knows well. William. Put him back in the machine. It's the only way to fix this. This strange world is the Animus. Hello? He is in here to keep him alive. Rebecca, get me out of here. The assassins in 2012 can't hear Desmond. They can't record in this part of the Animus, but Desmond can hear them. Rebecca Crane and Sean Hastings are dealing with the aftermath of Desmond's collapse and burying their friend, Lucy Stillman. Were they close? I mean, closer than friends? This new voice, William, is there to help. There was the occasional misty-eyed moment, but... Uh... She liked him, Bill. That's what she told me. Things got so fucked up so fast. Are you at the airport? Yeah, we're chartering a jet. Are you coming? Yes, yeah. I'll be there soon. For now, this is none of Desmond's concern. It seems he is stuck here, but he's not alone. For the first time, he is able to put a face to someone he knows so well. Just walk right past me. Subject 16. The man that left the symbols in blood. The breadcrumbs throughout Italy guiding us, sharing the truth. He is dead. Of course he is. This is just his consciousness. What is he doing here? But for now, Desmond has other questions. What is this place? We're in the guts of the Animus. The original test program. No memories here, just basic physics, weather simulations. For now, the Animus is keeping all your ancestors from collapsing into one big mess. But if you can't find a sync nexus, all those personalities will smash together. A sync nexus. That is what Desmond is to attain if he is to free himself and get back to his body. There. That thing is your way out. Through that door are unfinished memories. If Desmond can synchronize with them, he can attain a sync nexus and link back up with the real world. I keep the Animus distracted as best I can. For you, so you can explore. Finish what you started until your ancestor has nothing left to show you. And one of those ancestors is Ezio Auditori da Firenze. The year is 1511. Ezio Auditore is now 51. He has seen to the Borgia threat in Italy. He has revitalized the assassin order through his mentorship. And almost a year ago, he set out on a journey. A journey for truth. His father Giovanni sought the same truth. Ezio had a letter written a year before his birth where his father spoke of a library, a font of ancient wisdom hidden beneath the old home of the Levantine assassin, the old home of his ancestor Altair, 
Ibn Lahad, Masyaf Castle. As he ascends the walls, he senses his ancestor with every step as he touches every stone. Ezio won't recognize this hallway, these shelves, this desk, but Desmond will. As Altair, he met the shamed Al-Mulim him many times. The assassins no longer call this place their home. Altair saw to that. They do not shutter themselves in grand castles. They live amongst the people and cultures they are trying to protect. Ezio had already been in Masyaf for a while. He had met the new occupants, the Templars. They were here for the same reason they knew of the library. He met them on the road and at the gates, and as their captain Leandros put the rope around Ezio's neck and walked him to the ramparts. But in 30 years as an assassin, he had escaped worse. Ezio knew of the library through knowledge passed through his assassin lineage, but how did the Templars know? As Ezio plunges beneath the castle, they had found the door too. A workman employed by the Templars. It took me a year to find this chamber, and for the past three months I've been trying to break through this door. There are keyholes here. Where are the keys? These Templars found one beneath the Ottoman Sultan's palace. As for the others, I suppose the little book will tell them. What book? The captain of this Templar endeavor has it. Ezio chases him down. Niccolo Polo's journal. This will do you no good. We have found one of the Masyaf keys already and are closing in on the rest. You can have Altair's books, Ezio. We only want directions to the location of the Grand Temple. Grand Temple? Tell me more, now. Both Ezio and Desmond knew there were multiple temples or vaults with hidden secrets of the old ones within, but never one given the moniker of Grand. How did the Templars find out about the vault? Perhaps it was through this book, a journal written by the famed merchant and explorer Niccolo Polo, a record of the life and teachings of the Levantine mentor Altair who persuaded Niccolo to join the order. The door to Altair's library is opened by five keys. One of these keys was found beneath the Sultan's palace in Constantinople. This adventure is far from over, and with Niccolo Polo's journal in hand, he will use the journey to the heart of the Ottoman Empire to perhaps glean more clues about these elusive Masyaf keys. Ezio does not know what exactly the library holds, but he does know he must keep it from the hands of the Templars, who already have one key. Others are surely not far behind. Ezio arrives by boat to Constantinople. On his journey, he befriends a young man, a student. He learns of this new city. A magnificent sight. It is a work in progress. Constantinople, or Istanbul to some, on the cusp of the border between Europe and Asia. It is infused with multiple cultures and a funnel for valuable trade of all kinds since the Ottomans won the city from the hands of the Byzantines in 1453. Under Ottoman rule, the city flourished and became one of tolerance, affluence and vibrancy. Constantinia is a city for all kinds and creeds, students like me or uh, travellers such as yourself. Alighting the boat, having made a new acquaintance, he immediately has the opportunity to make another. You are the man I long to meet, renowned master and mentor, Ezio Auditori. This is Yusef Tazim, and news of Ezio's exploits in the Holy Land have travelled at a quicker clip than himself. Uh, come, I will show you around. Yusef is the head of the Ottoman Brotherhood of Assassins. They have lived in relative peace here in the city, but in recent years, the Byzantines have risen up under a Templar banner. They know not who leads them or what their end game is, but they have been a thorn in the shoe of the assassins for some time. There are two sons, both boasting a claim to their father Bayezid's sultanship. Ahmet holds the strongest claim and his brother Selim is abroad battling with the sultan to take that right by force. With the sultan away, the Byzantine Templars may see this as the best opportunity in years to take back power. Watch. But the Ottoman guards are far from pushovers. Byzantium is dead, as are you. 
Despite over 30 years as an assassin, Ezio yearned to learn more of how they do things here in the Ottoman Brotherhood. Ezio, where is your hook blade? You've never seen one? After years fighting the Borgia, he wished he had. The old dog delighted in this new trick that aided him to climb faster, swing farther, zip down wires and make quick departures from unwanted conflict. Worn on the opposite arm to the hidden blade, it would become a crucial part of Ezio's arsenal. My brothers in Roma would like this. That's not all they would like. Due to the city's position and the trade routes between the continents, the assassins would learn of many inventions from afar. And borrowed from the Chinese, Ezio would learn to wield bombs. Not only to kill, but also to entice and distract. There they go. Almost forgetting his higher purpose, Ezio was glad to be amongst this new brotherhood, learning and using his new skills to defend and win back the assassin strongholds dotted around the city. His work would have an effect on these areas. The inhabitants would stop cowering in terror and trade would begin to flourish. Blacksmiths, tailors and bookshops. The city was a true place of learning and improvement and Ezio experiences a fervor that belies his years. He feels alive once more. Indeed, working with Yusef, he would select and promote the most promising assassins to become masters of their own den and mentor them as he did those in Rome in the psychology and practicalities of being a master assassin. Until you are properly trained, I will not let you go head to head with a killer as deadly as this man. He had always been a natural leader, ever since his carefree days in Florence, but the practice of nurturing and guiding young talent and seeing them succeed in important tasks was what he valued most about his role as mentor. After helping to restore some sense of order in the city, he turns his attention to finding the former trading post of Niccolo Polo and continuing his search for the Masyaf keys. Yusef knows where to start. Speak with a man named Piri Reyes in the bazaar. He can point you in the right direction. Piri Reyes. The famed cartographer and navigator is an assassin and part of the Ottoman order. The old Polo shop. It's just west of Hagia Sophia. He leaves Piri for the trading post. It is now a bookshop. Buongiorno, please come in. And the woman running it, Ezio recognizes immediately. He noticed her while conversing with the young student on arriving into the city, like now, carrying books. I am Ezio Auditore. Sofia Sartore, have we met? We have now. Sofia hails from Italy but grew up in Constantinople, and now, due to her love of the written word, sources and prints rare books to sell in her shop. Ezio, under the guise of perusing these tomes, uses his skill to source a hidden door. Have you found anything interesting? Incredibile. Where does it lead? Why don't we find out? It leads to an underground cistern, lost to time but not lost to the Templars, who are on the hunt for their next Masyaf key. They are searching blind. Ezio has eagle vision, a factor Niccolo Polo was counting on when hiding the keys. Working through the Templars, Ezio finds the chamber to the first Masyaf key and a map that offers more clues to the remaining three keys still unfound. What did you find? Something that may interest you. Mio Dio, che meraviglia! And here is my shop! Perhaps it was her passion, her beauty, or deep knowledge of the area and the written word, but Ezio opened up to her and sought her help. Strange symbols, and these are titles of books, rare books. A few of these have not been seen for more than a millennium. Nicolo Polo hid these books around the city. This map should tell us where. From what I can tell, I need to find these three books first. They may contain clues to locate the rest of these. I must admit, my head is swimming with the prospect of seeing these books. This is knowledge the world has lost and must have again. The mystery has taken hold of her. He couldn't stop her helping now, even if he wanted to. It is a joy to see someone with a passion so personal and noble. It is inspiring. She will decipher the location of the books. Ezio leaves to investigate the nature of this first key. What is it? What information does it hold? He heads back to the assassin headquarters to find out. The markings on this key are familiar. I have seen its kind before, just like the Apple of Eden. Ancient technology from the first civilization. The key holds a memory. The memory of Altair over 300 years before. Altair is 24. This is new to Desmond. 
He joined Altair's memories after this point. Altair arrives in Masyaf. The home of the Templars is being invaded by Crusaders. A Templar had infiltrated the Brotherhood and now held Al Mulim and others prisoner, all about to die. We can do nothing for him now. Abbas sees little hope. Altair sees different. When I close the castle gate, flank the Crusaders in the village and drive them into the canyon. You don't stand a chance! Abbas, no mistakes. The plan was the right one. Altair saves the assassins and his mentor, Al Mulim. You fit your father's shoes as if they had been tailored to your feet. I did not know him well as a father. You too were born into this order. Do you regret it? How can I regret the only life I've ever known? That was all. Just a fragment of time, a fleeting memory. But what is Altair trying to tell us, I wonder? As Ezio experiences this memory, so too does Desmond. He is slowly synchronizing his ancestors' memories, working towards this sync nexus. While Sophia discerns the map, Ezio needs to work on finding the recovered key held by the Templars. It was found underneath Topkapi Palace. He needs to make some acquaintances inside the royal court. It's his best chance to find out more. He sees that chance as the assassins hear rumour of a planned Templar attack on the young Prince Suleiman, son to Salim, recently returned to the city. If they do strike, it will be tonight at a cultural exposition the Prince has organised. To protect him, they need disguises. Their best bet is as entertainers. Ezio looks to source the clothes of minstrels. Minstrels from Italia. I am going to enjoy this. Find that... They don the outfits, enter the palace and await the arrival of the prince. Suleiman, the sultan's grandson and governor of Kefe. The young man on the boat was no mere student. Ezio was sailing with royalty. And who is that? His uncle, Shehezade Ahmed. Sharafei. Despite his father and Prince Ahmed's dispute over the throne, Suleiman is fond of his uncle. Suleiman sits in council to Ahmed and sees his uncle as a mentor and source of wisdom. The Suleiman circulates amongst his guests. Ezio is there to stem the Templar attack on his acquaintance from the boat. It is a relief to see you again. Are you injured? Who is your captain's soldier? Tarek Balete. Someone Tarek to the Divan. These soldiers are known as Janissaries. The Sultan's elite soldiers trained warriors fiercely loyal to the crown and inordinately influential as to who wears it. Ezio, do you have some time to spare? I would like your opinion on something. Ezio was to listen in on the debriefing between the prince, his uncle, and the leader of the Janissaries, Tarek Barletti. How was this attack able to take place? An inexcusable failing, Effendim. I will conduct a full investigation. I will conduct the investigation, Tarek. Tarek Bey, a word. Ahmet suggests that the attack was to make his stewardship of the city look weak. I am not depraved enough to imagine the conspiracy you accuse me of. What have I done to earn such contempt from the Janissaries? Prince Ahmet is favoured by the Sultan to succeed the throne, but not by the Janissaries. They prefer the warring guile of his brother, Selim. You make a decent philosopher, Ahmed, but you will be a poor Sultan. They leave. Your uncle lacks sway over the man he will soon command. There is a rift in the power centre of the Ottoman Empire. What role are the Byzantine Templars playing in this? They need to find out more. Where should we begin? For now, keep an eye on Tariq and his Janissaries. They spend much of their free time in and around the bazaar. Ezio finds the Janissaries and Tariq and tails him to a rendezvous. He's waiting by the arsenal gate. An eager old weasel, isn't he? He is meeting Manuel Paleologos flanked by a menacing masked man. Manuel, one of the last surviving members of the Byzantine lineage that were driven from the region at the hands of the Ottomans. He survived by surrendering to the Ottomans and sold his right to the throne in exchange for riches and security. You may verify the amount, Tyler, but the money stays with me until I have seen the cargo for myself. Why is he trading with the head of the Janissaries? What is the cargo? Manuel needs to assess its quality in the safety of the arsenal. When you are satisfied, the cargo will be delivered to a location of your choosing. I will have a map drawn up for you within the week. Ezio must see the cargo for himself. To gain access to the armory, Ezio and the assassins stir up the discontent of the local populace, incite a riot, Push through! and break through the gates. In the confusion, Ezio infiltrates the warehouse. 
everything is falling into place. Manuel is not content in being one of the richest men in the empire. He has quietly resented the Ottomans for taking his birthright. As a Templar, the day he was hoping for is in sight. Is he the Grand Master of the Templars? It seems likely. When the Palaio Logos line is restored, Manuel, do not forget who helped you bring it back. Manuel is not the only person that feels wronged by the Ottomans. Shakulu supports Manuel in his aim. His family were killed at the hands of the Ottomans. He seeks revenge. I'm satisfied. Take me to my ship. The cargo is rifles, and they are to weaponize a Templar army to take the Ottoman throne. But where is this army? He must find out where the guns are destined. With Prince Suleiman's consent, he disguises himself as a Janissary, infiltrates their barracks, finds the tent of Tarek Barletti and finds out where the guns are heading, the location of the Byzantine army. The rifles have arrived in Cappadocia, where Manuel has garrisoned his army. Ezio has the location, but the Templar Tarek Barletti must die first. Except he's not a Templar. He was doing as Ezio is, seeking an end to the Byzantine threat of the Ottoman Empire. I was preparing an ambush, preparing to strike the Byzantine Templars where they felt safest, protect my homeland assassin. An innocent man is dead. Ezio leaves with the location of the army and the knowledge that Tarek had spies inside the city of Cappadocia. He must go there. It's not only his duty to stem the Templar's rise to power at every turn, but it might give further clues as to the location of the Masyaf key held by the Templars. He reports to Prince Suleiman. He was loyal to your grandfather to the end, and through his efforts, we have the means to save your city. I will arrange a ship to take you. His uncle, Prince Ahmed, arrives. Suleiman, I have been set up. It is no secret that he and I were at odds. Ah, forgive me, nephew. I was not aware that you had a guest. This is Marcello, one of my European advisors in Cafe. Buonasera. With his identity protected, Ezio leaves. He has things to attend to before he departs by boat to Cappadocia. His other new friend in the city has discerned the map enough for Ezio to source Niccolo Polo's hidden books. Within them are marked the location of other hidden tombs. Exploring the depths of those proved complex, but fruitful, as Ezio emerged from each with a total of three more keys. Despite their success, Ezio is saddened that their search for the keys has come to an end. He spent many hours with Sophia discerning the map, as well as discussing literature and geography and history and all the passions that they both shared an interest. Ezio's ardor for the female form had been tempered over the years. Partly his age, partly his learned respect for women, partly his focus on the cause, but mostly due to the pain of loss he has faced in his life. He could not protect his first love, Christina Vespucci, when he was drawn into the Brotherhood. He could not be there for her during Savonarola's sack of Florence when she died in his arms. Later, his guarded heart would be captured by Caterina Sforza, but again, the struggle would trump any chance of a quiet, happy existence. He was married to the cause, and anyone he got close to would be at risk by mere association with him. Despite this, Ezio cared deeply for Sophia, and that care was returned. Before his voyage, Sophia arranges a picnic. I wanted to thank you for letting me play a small role in your adventure. A small role is enough for this adventure, believe me. You are a mystery, Ezio Auditore. I will explain one day, Sophia, when I can. He can't place her in danger any more than he already has. Together, they have found three more keys. Before he leaves for Cappadocia, Ezio and by design Desmond learns more of the life of Altair. After Altair had disarmed the corrupt Al Mualim of the Apple, there was acute confusion. The assassins, the city of Masyaf, were woken from the spell cast by the Peace of Eden in their mentor's charge. Altair was in no doubt what he had to do. Altair! No! I must know that he cannot return. But this is not our way! Abbas leads the chorus of discontent. All your life, you have made a mockery of our glee. You bend the rules to suit your whims. In the melee, Abbas takes and wields the apple. Abbas! Stop! What did you think would happen when you murdered our beloved mentor? 
Abbas is not steered by principles or love of al Mulim. He is guided by pain, by hate. Hate for Al-Tayyar over his father's death. His father Ahmed died when he was a child. al Mulim kept the truth from Abbas, but it was suicide. Shamed by his betrayal of Umar, al Tayyar's father, Akhmet cut his own throat in front of al Tayyar. He kept it a secret as long as he could, but told his friend Abbas of his father's suicide in the end. Having been fed a different story by al Mualim, Abbas could not discern the truth. Their friendship was fractured and the mystery ate a piece of Abbas every day since. My father was a hero! Whatever this artifact is capable of, you are not worthy to wield it! No man is! Abbas felt its power, its mystery, but he could not contain it. al Tayyar could. Forgive me, I did not know. Have you anything to teach us, or would you lead us all to ruin? al Tayyar would forgive Abbas and those that stood for al Mulim and take charge of the assassins. As mentor, the assassin and its creed would find new strength and a singular focus to fight for liberty in their region and beyond. He also sought to learn from the apple and apply its teachings where he could. He would marry Maria, a woman whose life he once had in his hands. They had children, Darim and Seth. With the threat of the Mongols in the east approaching, al Tayyar elected to leave the order, now stronger than ever, and attend to this threat with his wife and son, Darim. In their absence, Abbas took control of the order and killed their son, Seth. al Tayyar and Maria return to Masyaf and prepare to confront Abbas. He executed our youngest son, Maria. He deserves to die. Resist your desire for revenge, al Tayyar. Speak truth and they will see their error. They have every reason to strike with vengeance, but the strength of the order transcends their pain. When we left Masyaf ten years ago, this order was strong, but all our progress has been undone. They arrive in the gardens of Masyaf Castle. You have held that artifact for 30 years, reveling in its power and hoarding its secrets. Surrender the apple, Al Tair, and I will tell you why your son was put to death. Very well, Abbas. Take it. Before I executed your son, I told him you ordered it yourself. There are some things reason cannot overcome. Strength, Altair. But passion in place of reason has meant the loss of his wife as well as his son. Altair has no choice but to flee with his last remaining son, Dari. My love. For 20 years, al Tayyar stays away. He mourns and he turns to the apple to learn and understand, fabricate its technology. All this time, the brotherhood slips further and further into decline. In 1247, aged 81, al Tayyar returns to take back the brotherhood. Abbas has maddened himself with hatred. It is not our place to judge. If our master has gone mad, I would like to know. Al Tayyar knows he has allies. He had many from his legend alone, but Abbas has delivered him the rest. As Al Tayyar approaches the castle, some confront, some step aside, most rally to his aid. What are you waiting for? He has bewitched you! You have wasted your life staring into that apple. I learned many things from the apple, of the past and the future. Let me show you. With Masyaf reclaimed, al Tayyar will set about rebuilding the order, restoring it to how he left it and using his years of wisdom to improve it further still. The assassins were his life from beginning to end. He had no other. Ezio arrived in Cappadocia, a city carved into the hills, a bustling populace controlled by Byzantines. He was there to investigate the extent of the Templar army, their hierarchy and their plans. First he would seek out Tarek's people, installed to learn more. They had been found out, captured and systematically tortured by the sadistic masked man Shakulu. Ezio must disable this Templar army. He infiltrates the armory, blows up the munitions 
and draws out the Byzantine Templar, Manuel Paleologos. We fight to restore peace to this troubled land. Templars are always quick to talk of peace, but very slow to concede power. Your dream dies with you, Manuel. Your empire is gone. But I am not the only one with this vision, assassin. All Templars are part of the same family. I am here for the Masyaf key. Ezio has the final key, the key to open the library. Altair's font of wisdom and the Grand Master of the Byzantine Templars is dead. Except he wasn't their leader, merely a cog in the wheel. Another topped the Templars hierarchy. Poor Manuel, last of the Palaer Logi. I should not have put him in charge of our Masyaf expedition. Prince Ahmed. Disappoint me, Ahmed. Why the Templars? Because I am tired of all of these pointless blood feuds that pit father against son, brother against brother. To achieve true peace, mankind must think and move as one body. The secrets in the Grand Temple will give us just that, and Altair will lead us there. I am here for the Masyaf Keys. Perhaps I should ask someone who knows better, Sophia Sartor. She knows nothing! Leave her be! We shall see. Achmet turns his boat and heads to Constantinople to capture Sophia hostage. As Ezio suffers the boat journey home with impatience, he takes this time to view the fifth and final Masyaf key. It is 1257 and Altair is 92. The Mongols are advancing quickly from the east and a recent inductee in the order, Niccolo Polo, is being given a vital task to guard his codex, his life's work, so that he may propagate the wisdom establishing guilds throughout the world. The first of which, Constantinople. We are ready. A last favor, Niccolo. He also gave him the five Masyaf keys. Each one imbued with a message. A message for whom? I wish I knew. Ezio did know, but he must see Sophia safe. He arrives at the bookshop, before leaving for Cappadocia, Ezio asked that Yusef keep an eye on Sophia while he was gone. Sophia was not there, but the bodies of Byzantine Templars and the body of his new friend Yusuf Tazim was. Brothers, sisters, the whole city rises against us, while Yusuf's murderer waits and watches from the arsenal. Fight with me! and show him what it means to cross the assassins. Ezio and the assassins enter the arsenal once more and find Achmet, but he cannot kill him. He has Sophia. Bring the seals to Galata Tower when you are ready, and Sophia will be spared. My brother's army will be here soon, Ezio. After that, everything changes. Prince Suleiman is there to hear his uncle's secret. Achmet follows the Templar order. The world is a tapestry of many colors and patterns. A just leader would celebrate this, not seek to unravel it. He fears the disorder that comes from difference. Spare my uncle if you can. Would your father? No. Ezio has the keys. He could head to Masyaf now and open the library, but there is no question of doing that yet. He must save Sophia. He heads to Galata Tower. Now, the keys. First, the girl. She's all yours. Sophia! Ezio has no choice. He relinquishes the Masyaf keys, climbs the tower, but it's a trick. Sophia hangs below, close to death. He must be quick. I did not mean to drag you into this. I'm sorry, but I need to recover what they have taken. I do not understand what is happening, Ezio. Who are these men? Run! As Achmet leaves the city with the keys en route to the library, Ezio and Maria give chase. The Masyaf keys. So what now, Ezio? How does this end? I am wondering that myself. Arriving back from the conflict with the Sultan, Achmet's brother Selim oh. has claimed the throne for himself. Where is he? Where is the Sultan? He stands before you, brother. Father made his choice. I am Selim, Suleiman's father. Were it not for his endorsement, I would have you killed where you stand. Leave this place. Do not return. 
This is not your fight. But where does one end and the next begin? Back in 1506 in Rome, Ezio Aditore and his friend Leonardo da Vinci entered the Pythagorean vault and activated a pedestal. What they saw was not understood by either of them. Ezio was used to this. But back in 2012, the assassins knew them to be coordinates to a location. The assassins were now on their way there. Bill, good to see you. I hope you have something for us. Absolutely. Passports and papers for everyone. This is crazy. Desmond's brain is lighting up like a string of firecrackers. Here it comes. What is that? Desmond's time in this partition of the Animus is coming to an end. He is nearing complete synchronization on the memories he needs to complete the Sync Nexus. And this test program that has kept him safe is collapsing. And with it, the consciousness that has done most to keep Desmond alive. Subject 16. He has a name, Clay Kazmarek. Unlike Desmond, he was not born into the Order. His parents weren't assassins, he was recruited, trained, covertly installed into Abstergo by this voice, William. Break into Abstergo, gather the intel and get out. Prove yourself, novice, and you will be one of us. And when done, he would be extracted by Lucy Stillman. Now Lucy will get you direct access to the Animus at night. And once you have enough information, she'll get you out. But Clay was not extracted. He knew too much. He was allowed to succumb to the bleeding effect by extended periods in the Animus. Until one day, he stayed there, installing his consciousness permanently in the Animus, after which he took his own life. He knew about Lucy. He knew their plan. If our experiments with Desmond and the Animus aren't going well, you will remove him from Abstergo. Take him somewhere he will feel comfortable divulging his secrets. Desmond will lead you to the Apple, and then you bring it right to us. You have served the Templar Order well. Lucy died at the hands of the Apple because she was instructed to take it to the Templars. At heart, it appeared she was a Templar. Had her time with the Assassins shifted this allegiance? A question that can now never be answered. As Clay Kazmarek submitted his consciousness to the Animus, he was given his final task by Juno to make sure Desmond survives. Your eyes are now open. Help Desmond Miles. I will. As the test program collapses, his final act is to do just that. What are you doing? I'm saving you, idiot! Go! back into the Animus on the cusp of achieving his Sync Nexus to experience one last memory. Ezio had been fighting for over 30 years. Like Desmond, like Altair, he did not choose this life. It was thrust upon him. He's tired. He embarked on this journey from his homeland in search of truth, reasons for the ways of this world and his place within it. What he found was love deepened further by the long road to Masyaf, Sophia choosing to stay by his side as he completed this journey with the keys to the library. For three decades, I have served the memory of my father and my brothers. I do not regret those years, but it is time to live for myself and let them go. Then let go, you will not fall far. With the five keys, Ezio opens Altair's library sealed shut for 300 years. You had better come out of there alive. I plan to. Many shelves, but no books. Just a chair with a figure slumped within it. Requiescat in pace, Altair. Holding a sixth Masyaf key. Ezio is transported to the day the library was sealed. Father, I do not understand. Why did you build a library if you did not intend to keep your books? You should go. When the Mongols return, Masyaf must be empty. Go be with your family and live well. Masyaf is no longer home to the assassins, but sealed in this tomb, it will be the final resting place of Altair. In it, he will guard the apple for a day he will never see, to share secrets with a person he will never meet. He sits with his last recorded memory and waits. Another artifact. I have seen enough for one life. 
As it was when he met Minerva, he knows his purpose has not been to understand. His purpose was to reveal, and he senses this is his last revelation as an assassin. The apple is activated. Desmond? He's talking to me? Who are we who have been so blessed to share our stories like this? To speak across centuries? Maybe you will be the one to make all this suffering worth something in the end. Now, listen. Desmond has achieved his sync nexus. Do you hear me, Cypher? Can you see me? This is Jupiter. Like Minerva and Juno, he was one that came before. They are in a nexus of time and he is here to illuminate Desmond on the work they did in the vaults, trialing and testing methods to save the world. Each vault's knowledge was transmitted to a single place. The Grand Temple, where they tested the most promising methods. But none worked. And then the world ended. Desmond would see the world as it was during their time. He saw the solar catastrophe eviscerate everyone and everything save a handful of humanity and even less of Jupiter's kind. But they worked together to rebuild and to renew. But what of the impending catastrophe prophesied by Minerva? Listen, you must go there. Take my words, pass them from your head into your hands. That is how you will open the way. The assassins have traveled far, to the coordinates that Ezio showed them, to that place on Jupiter's globe, to the east coast of America. Wait, look, his vitals are stabilizing. He hears that voice again, that voice he knows so well. Desmond, can you hear me, son? I know what we need to do. Desmond's purpose is still in motion, here at the entrance to the Grand Temple, but his time with Ezio has come to an end. He has nothing left to show him. Ezio lived the remainder of his years in the Tuscan countryside, healing the pain he endured, reflecting on the lessons he had learnt, and growing the family he started with Sophia. He found love, contentment, and finally, peace. Son? Desmond knows just what to do. His fellow assassins, Rebecca, Sean, and now his father, William, know where it has to be done. They were given the coordinates by the ones who came before. They have guided them here, to Turin, a small village outside of New York, USA, to enter this grand temple. They hope a place where they can stop the impending catastrophe. This cataclysmic event. The ones who came before ultimately succumbed to an event like this thousands of years prior. They see Desmond as humanity's only hope for it to not happen again. The date prophesied for this apocalypse is December 21st, 2012. They have 52 days. Let's go. The apple, taken from the vault under the Colosseum, opens the ancient doors. The same apple that Juno worked through to stop it getting into Templar hands. Hipstego's hope was to use it for their satellite launch, now not to be. The apple was needed for this purpose. Another artifact found on the temple floor turns on the lights, but there is something missing. Something they need to access the inner chamber. Within it, they can understand how they, how Desmond, can save humanity. Juno is here to help them. The key. You must find the key. <sighs> here we go again. Desmond has travelled the ages, visiting his ancestors in his time with the Animus. He has been to the time of the Crusades with Altair. He has seen Renaissance Italy with Ezio. 
And now, here in the temple, as his friends and father place his unconscious body under the rapture of the bleeding effect into Rebecca's newly updated animus, he is to experience the life of this man. His name is Connor. This is a story about family, about loss, hatred, revenge, duty, struggle and sacrifice. But perhaps mostly for Connor, it's about belonging. But we're not ready for his story yet. To find the key to the inner chamber, Desmond needs to go back a little further. Across the Atlantic, to London. It's 1754. Invitation, please. Who is this man? He finds his target like an assassin. He scales the walls of the opera house like one, and he bears his hidden blade in a way Desmond has seen so many times. This assassin is here for something, just like Desmond. Here for the key. This is what they need. This man is Haytham Kenway, and he returns his prize to his fellow assassins and his master, Reginald Birch. They too search for the temple, fascinated by the knowledge of this lost civilization. I hold in my hand a key, and if this book is to be believed, it will open the doors of a storehouse built by those who came before. Whatever waits behind those doors shall prove a great boon to us all. Or our enemies, should they find it first. They don't know what Desmond knows, but they were on the trail. A trail that became lost. Why? They know the temple lies on the east coast of America. And that is why we've called you here, Master Kenway. We'd like for you to travel to America, locate the storehouse, and take possession of its contents. Upon this paper are the names of five men sympathetic to our cause. We've booked you passage to Boston. Your ship leaves at dawn. Go forth, Haytham, and bring honor to us all. On the cusp of his 30th year, Haytham Kenway arrives in Boston on his brotherhood's search for the Grand Temple. Boston, in the middle of the 18th century, at the very start of the Seven Years' War. America, colonized by over two million Britons and far less French. The French compete in the war between them by rallying Native Americans to their cause. In Boston, in 1754, Haytham arrives to a city controlled by British redcoats. There is relative peace. Trade exists in the ports, but with a war brewing, poverty and discontent is on the rise. Please! Someone stop him! Haytham Kenway has a job to do, and a list of names in which to help him. One of those names is waiting at the port. Charles Lee, sir. A pleasure to make your acquaintance. Charles has been given leave from the British Army to help Haytham set up his team. An order sent over from London, the Brotherhood there has reach. I had hoped that I might study under you. If I am to serve the order, I can imagine no better mentor than yourself. Charles is not part of their order yet, but admires and aligns with what they stand for. He is keen to impress Haytham. Oh, no need, sir. I've arranged for your bags to be delivered to the inn. That inn is the Green Dragon Tavern, and it will be the headquarters for all the work Haytham and his team will undertake in the coming years. With the help of Charles Lee, they begin to gather those names. William Johnson, a man with great knowledge of the surrounding lands and native people living within it. Thomas Hickey, a strong pair of hands with his ear to the ground of the criminal underworld. Benjamin Church. He's a finder and a fixer. And a doctor with a broad knowledge of the city. And finally, John Pitcairn. He will prove difficult to recruit. He currently serves the British soldiers, his commander, Edward Braddock. Braddock and Haytham share a history. They served their orders as brothers, but... Edward was one of us upon a time, and I considered him a close friend. But everything changed at the siege of Bergen op Zoom. He killed and killed. He maintained that violence was a more efficient solution. It became his mantra, and it broke my heart. Braddock is the same commander that Charles Lee serves, currently released to help Haytham. It's Charles Lee's connections that gets them in the barracks where Pitcairn is currently installed. Haytham, General Braddock. It's bad enough my superiors have insisted. I grant you use of Charles, but they said nothing about this traitor. You'll not have him. Denied, but not deterred, Haytham and Charles later ambush a patrol containing Pitcairn. They get their man to the disdain of Braddock. Traitor, go on then. Join them on their fool's errand. I stay my hand today because you were once my brother. 
or should our paths ever cross again, all debts will be forgotten. Haytham has his team. He now sets about tapping their strengths. We believe there's a precursor site in the region. I require your knowledge of the land and its people to find it. In his business pursuits, Johnson has long had dealings with the local native tribespeople. And when he sees Haytham's artifact, he immediately makes a connection. It appears Canyon Gahaga in Origin. Can you trace it to a specific location? I need to know where it came from. Johnson lacks this knowledge, but the Canyon Kahaka tribe may know more. This is not information they will give freely, especially to the British. We'll need to earn their trust before they'll share what they know. There may be a way. Hickey hears rumor. Men moonlighting among the British are kidnapping and enslaving the native people. Freeing those captured while slaying the man in charge may go some way to earning that trust. Benjamin Church knows just the man capable of such an endeavor. A British soldier named Silas Thatcher. A crueler and more vicious creature I've never known. Their plan is simple. Disguise themselves, gain entry under guise of ferrying newly captured natives and shut down the operation for good. But as Haytham takes his place at the helm of the slaver's carriage, his focus on the task wavers. One of the captured slaves is this woman. We're here to help you, along with those held inside Southgate Fort. Free me. Not until we're inside the gate. Using the woman and her tribespeople as cover, they enact their plan. Hold. Delivery for Silas. The slaver's ring destroyed, the captives liberated. See? I'm freeing you just as I said I would. Now, if you'll allow me to explain. It is clear to Haytham that the trust they seek will take time. Who is this woman? And how has such a brief encounter made him feel this way? He must see her again, for his order's sake, as well as his own. It would be months before Charles Lee finds a lead. Word is she's been stirring up trouble just outside the city in a town called Lexington. Haytham uses his innate skills passed down through the ages to track this elusive woman. I come in peace. What do you want? Well, your name, for one. I'm Gudzi Zio. God, Gudzi. Just call me Zio. With her name just as complex as the feelings in his heart, he plainly gets to the point. She recognizes the artifact immediately. I've only seen such markings in one other place. She is still reticent to share. Look, I am not the enemy. There is more Zio can gain from this man than just her freedom. That town hosts soldiers who seek to drive my people from these lands. They're led by a man known as the Bulldog. Edward Braddock. You know him? He is no friend of mine. Haytham spared Braddock once through nostalgia, but his death will now pay for something far greater. Ridding this threat to Zio's people will earn the trust needed to learn of this sacred place. Braddock's death is the key. But first, we have to find him. It would take time, time spent together, gaining intel, putting plans in place. Their connection grew. That wasn't necessary, but thank you. We should move on. They have a plan. They know where he'll be, why he'll be there, and when. We will ambush him here near the river. Go and gather your allies. I will do the same. It would be five months before their plan would come to fruition. But with the assassins and their allies assembled, it was time to sabotage Braddock's expedition. He plans to take Fort Duquesne from the French. Everything all right, sir? Amongst his officers is a young, ambitious George Washington. Just savoring the moment. The French will leave, or they will die! Braddock's moment would be dashed. They are ambushed en route, and amongst the chaos, the assassins strike. In a red coat disguise, Haytham gets his chance. Your death opens a door. It's nothing personal. Well, maybe it is a little personal. But we are brothers in arms. Once, perhaps. All those innocents slaughtered, and for what? Whether we applied the sword more liberally and more often, the world would be a better place. Haytham gives him the assassin blade, but takes a ring. They were once brothers, but even within brotherhoods, method and purpose sometimes fail to align. Haytham sees this as a cleansing and strips him of his life and his place in the order. Zio's trust has now been earned, and she takes Haytham to the sacred site where the symbols match the amulet. Will this key open a door? The artifact glows, as do the ancient symbols on the walls, but the key 
is not the right one. No. No! This room is all there is. I expected more. What do they mean? It tells the story of Yotze Tizu. Her eyes still watch over us. Her ears still hear our words. Her hands still guide us. And her love still gives us strength. I... I should go. With his heart unlocked, and with the door to the answers he sought closed to him, he returns to his brotherhood to regroup. We need to redouble our efforts and expand our order. It is time to recognise one of their own. Just as the recruits of times past are inducted, it is time for a ceremony. He has proven himself a loyal disciple and served unerringly since the day he came to us. Initially teased privately for being a sycophant, overeager, too keen to please, the assassins have accepted him, and it is vital to their success he becomes a permanent member. Then we welcome you into our fold, brother. To Desmond, the ceremony had perhaps changed throughout the ages. The Levantine assassins sacrificed a finger. The assassins of Italy saw fit only to brand their loyalty. Give me your hand. Now here, in Boston, this fledgling brotherhood of the Americas opted only for a ring. But Desmond did not recognise the tone of the ceremony. It did not chime with those he'd seen before. The rhetoric was off. Something was not right. Together, we will usher in the dawn of a new world. One defined by purpose and order. You are a Templar. Wait, what? May the Father of Understanding guide us. Desmond's ancestry had included a Templar. There were signs, obvious to him now, but he had not the time to feel duped by time. After all, they knew who had the key. They must follow its trail. But to do this, they must follow the DNA. Not only did Haytham earn Zio's trust, he also earned her love. And in reciprocating that love, they spent a stolen spell together, which they knew could not last. They stepped away from both of their worlds for a moment and for a short time created their own in the wilderness. But unbeknownst to Haytham, Zio returned to her world bearing his child. The lineage had passed from father to son. To follow the trail of the key, Desmond must now live the memories of Ratuna Gaiden. Desmond, you need to keep going. But in the Grand Temple, Desmond struggled with his more immediate lineage. Desmond left the assassin order he was born into at 16. He was captured by the Templars and used. Since escaping, he has spent little time outside the service of his cause, the cause for a time he felt his father imposed upon him. I'm sick of being a goddamn pawn. I thought it might be different with you. I mean, you're my father, but it turns out you're no better than the fucking Templars. <clears throat> Maybe I pushed a little too hard, asked a little too much, but try and remember exactly what's at stake here. The emotional disconnection, the one that turned him from his family, from his cause, still exists. But since the moment he entered the Animus, he has seen firsthand the cause of the assassins through the ages, the oppression of the Templars and the gravity of the impending catastrophe. He does not need to have the cause imposed upon him by anyone anymore. He knows what he must do. This is his cause. Within the Animus, he must follow the key, but within the Temple, they also have a problem. They need to find more sources of power, like Desmond first found in the temple. In order to power the temple sufficiently, to gain access to the inner chambers, they need more. This task lies on Sean's shoulders. I intend to tiptoe into the Abstergo database. Now, if I can cross-reference these particular devices with their database, then maybe we'll get lucky. The ones who came before led them to this temple. The spectre of Juno seems to be present. She appears sporadically, urging the assassins to keep going to unlock the secrets within. Do you think it's a recording or is she a ghost? But I can't shake the feeling we're being watched. I don't know why they had to make this all so complicated. I mean, if they need something from me, they should just come out and say it. Throughout Desmond's journey, he's met this triad of characters, Juno, Minerva, Jupiter, inside the Sync Nexus, but never collectively. I get the sense Juno and Minerva didn't exactly see eye to eye, but maybe you'll find something down here that can shed light on the mystery. What happened between them and why? Desmond doesn't need coaxing from Juno. He enters the Animus, a new ancestor beckons. Red. 
Rathuna Gaedun had his father's eyes. He was told this, he'd never met him. Despite being a child of two worlds, he was loved by his tribe. Their village was in the heart of the Mohawk Valley. Despite the importance of the valley as a route to the frontier by colonists, they still kept their lands. Choosing not to fight with the French during the Seven Years' War, now over. Looking to stay impartial, hoping to be ignored, the village was near that cave. Those symbols, they saw it as part of their culture to protect its mysteries. Radunagedun's mother, Zio, the daughter of the clan mother, traded that mystery. She loved Haytham once, but she knew him and feared that Haytham's darkness, his lust for control, would rear itself in her son. But at this age, she just saw a playful, curious child and did her best to create a safe and loving world for him. On the day her child went out to the valley to play, that world ended. What have we here? You look familiar. Where have I seen you before? We have questions for your elders. Only tell us where your village is, boy, and you can go. For Desmond, this is not the quiet, helpful, unassuming Charles Lee he had seen through the eyes of Haytham. This was a man with the eyes of hate. He meant harm to the Mohawk people. Ratuna Gerdun would never tell. You are a nothing, a speck of dust. You and all your ilk. But I am not unkind. Let them know the sooner we are given what we seek, the sooner you can return to your pathetic, empty lives. What is your name? <laughs> Charles Lee. Why do you ask? So I can find you. Awakening from the black, Radunagedon rushes back to the place he feels safest. He hadn't seen a white man before. These people with desire and disdain in their eyes. Despite his outward bravery, he had never been so scared in his life. If he were to describe evil, what he saw in the eyes of this man would be it. Yeah! And that evil had found his village. The men didn't need his help to find it. It was a blaze burning in the name of ambition, and greed, he had one thought, his mother. They say, to raise a child takes a village, and this village rebuilt. Raised Radunagedon with love. The clan mother, his grandmother, loved him and knew there was a plan for him. Nine years later, he was 13. His loss was still with him, but he had grown strong. He climbed, he hunted better than anyone his age, better than his best friend, Canon Dorgan, but he never leaves him behind. He does his best to elevate his peers. The valley is still a paradise to them, with all the bounties they would ever need, but more and more colonists have been seen, and it's only a matter of time before they settle here, forcing his tribe out. They gather special items for a ceremony called by the clan mother. Ratunagerdun has no idea what awaits him. The crowds part. The clan mother knows it's time for him to understand his destiny. Why they do not wander like the other tribes. Why they hide from the conflict brewing in their lands. For they have a purpose that transcends this. To protect what is sacred. The clan mother presents the artifact that has been entrusted to them through the ages. A piece of Eden. Its purpose is to deliver a message to one individual. To show what might be and what might be changed. On touching the artifact, Raduna Gerdun is transported to the Nexus. Greetings, Guardian. Juno. You, who will bring to him the last piece, that he may open the door. I do not understand. Nor need you. In the form of an eagle, the Nexus takes him through the probability of time. How a malevolent group planned to seize their lands, destroy their sanctuary. Juno explains his special lineage. Many who have changed the world who will change the world, 
so too shall you. He and his people know it only as the sanctuary. They'll never know it as the temple and what it holds within it. He knows only that he is chosen to save his people to protect this site. For if the men with evil in their eyes enter it too soon, it will mean the end. Radunagerdun must save his home and his people at all costs. He must then retrieve the key. What am I to do? You will learn of a man who will provide additional training. Seek this symbol. As he emerges from the Nexus, he scrambles to remember this symbol. It is his first breadcrumb. The clan mother knows it well. Once upon a time, her daughter, his mother, sought help from this same man. He lies to the east. It is 1769, and at 13, he will leave the Mohawk Valley for the first time and enter the frontier. He feared what lay ahead, but knew the fate of his people if he chose inaction. He will find this man, and after days of travel, he does, at the homestead described by the clan mother. What? I, I was told you could train me. No. This is not the outcome he had rehearsed during those miles through the frontier, but there was no question of him giving up. The homestead was grand, but it used to be grander. It had clearly been neglected in its structure and surroundings. He used its ramshackle stables to rest and shelter, persisting daily, meeting the same outcome. Get the hell off my land! He would not, not even when the skills he wished to learn were used against him. You! Ah. <clears throat> Stay this course, and the only thing you're gonna be is dead. Fear had never been a deterrent for a Dunagerdon. The world's moved on, boy. Best you do too. He licked his wounds in the stables. You will train me. You have to. His chance to break through to the old man would arrive, in the form of bandits. Here to strip the homestead of further value. The Dunagerdon's fighting skills are instinctive, but rough. Ah! The man could see this. Thank you. Clean this up. Then I suppose we should talk. This is Achilles Davenport. Like the house he hides within, he is old, broken and past his best. Like Raduna Gerdon, he is a man of different colour to the European colonists who brought their entitlement, greed and oppression to this land. He once defended himself and others against this. Mentor of the colonial order of assassins, but both the brotherhood and his will was broken and collapsed. He did not know it, but inviting Radunagerdun in, he had invited in hope. Hope he thought was lost forever. Who are you? My name is Rado Hangado. Right. Well, I'm not even going to try and pronounce that. I was told to seek this symbol. The spirit said that, that I am- spirits of yours have been harassing the assassins for centuries, ever since Ezio uncorked the bottle. Uh, but you don't even know what an assassin is, do you? Over the course of that long evening and into the night, Raduna Gerdon found out about the history of the Brotherhood, the Templars, the ones who came before and about his lineage. Painful truths like his father, Haytham, the leader of the Templars, will stand in the way of his ultimate mission. To save his people, to protect their secret, he is and has the key to all of this. He also remembers those eyes. Charles Lee is a Templar and now an enemy in more ways than one. The man responsible for his mother's death. They have to die, don't they? All of them, even my father. If they succeed, your spirit's visions will become reality. Come on, I've something to show you. Huh. I don't think you can just come in here, throw those on, and call yourself an assassin. I, I did not. I, I would never presume. Before that, he needs to prepare himself for everything that is to come. What he sought comes to pass. Achilles spends the next weeks, months, indeed years training him. His body and his mind sculpting him into the beginnings of an assassin. He is exposed to history, philosophy, politics and how to kill. While feeding Radunagerdun the wisdom he needs, he is also fed life into himself. 
He sees a future he did not care to fathom before, and with that, a care to improve the house, the homestead around him, to make a home instead of a prison. The closest city, Boston, has some of the supplies needed to do this. Raduna Gerdon sees the beauty, bedlam, and bureaucracy of the big city of Boston for the first time. He is awed by it. There is so much life here, so many opportunities. For a few, my boy. He also learns its dangers and how to avert the gaze of the redcoats, to blend in and divert, and also how to get around the city fast and undetected. Achilles explains the change that is starting to brew in these new lands. The British spent big in their Seven Years' War against the French. Their efforts to tax the colonists to pay for it are met with disdain. There is talk of revolution, but will that also be for the few? Maybe it is this change in the air that prompts Achilles to suggest a change for Radunagedon. You're also going to need a new name. Your skin is fair enough that you might pass for one with uh, Spanish or Italian blood. What would you call me then? Achilles knows instinctively. Connor. Yes, that will be your name. So Connor has a new name. Home, a new life, and a mentor. His mother once worried that he may inherit some of his father's nature, but our nature reacts to the movements and mentors around us. Connor absorbs and adopts the assassin philosophy with all his heart, perhaps never to be wavered or broken. In all his fibre, he is a guardian, as Juno called him. He would choose to guard the freedom of all those denied it, denied by men like his father. The biggest lesson he was to learn that went against his nature is patience. He knows he needs to spend time absorbing everything he can if he's to stand up to the skills of his father. It's not until 1773, his 17th birthday, that both he and Achilles believe he can begin his fight. If you're going to stand a chance against the Templars, you're going to need these. And this. Put them on. You've your tools and training, your targets and goals. And now you have your title. Welcome to the Brotherhood, Connor. He is now ready to take the fight to Charles Lee, to the Templars, to his father. Back in the temple, Sean's hunt has borne fruit. I've managed to locate a power source, and it's relatively close by. A short drive to Manhattan, but there's a catch. I think we're better off having you drop in from above. What do you mean, above? Desmond parachutes from the adjacent building to the Abstergo office below. It's too easy. The artifact is on display in a corner office. Did Abstergo even know what they had? That wasn't so bad. So, you must be Desmond. Who are you? Ask your father. I'm not supposed to kill you. But the boss man didn't say anything about fucking you up. So you got to the cap. Abstergo had tracked them, but Desmond has the artifact, and on returning to the temple, the assassins fill Desmond in on this mystery Templar. So who the hell is Daniel Cross? Believe it or not, he used to be an assassin. It turned out he was a sleeper agent for Abstergo, programmed to infiltrate and destroy the organization. Cross is a dangerous asset to Warren Vidic and the Templars. His volatility, his mental state has been exacerbated by extended periods in the Animus. They must be wary of him. Abstergo know what the assassins search for, and they are tracking them. They need two more power sources which Sean will track down, all the while avoiding Daniel Cross and the Cross he represents. Desmond focuses again on the key. In the four years since Connor had been at the homestead, he had seen great change in both himself and the people of this land. The British were losing their grip on America and something new was brewing. But underneath this, the assassin sensed strings were being pulled by the Templars for their own ends. He saw this in Boston, as Charles Lee's gunshot lit the touch paper of discontent outside the Boston Custom House. He saw the satisfaction in his father's face as lives were lost and hatreds galvanized. They want power. If not through the British, then they look to place themselves somewhere in this emerging regime. Connor must determine where, but where to start. It will start with Connor on the back foot. His childhood friend, Canon Dorgan, delivers news of the British looking to force them from their lands. They said that the land was being sold and that the Confederacy had consented. Do you have a name? He's called William Johnson. 
At this moment, he resides somewhere in Boston, preparing for the purchase of the land. Connor must defend the tribe he still feels so much a part of. Achilles knows who can help draw out William Johnson. Connor finds Samuel Adams, a member of the Sons of Liberty. Samuel Adams, at your service. Adams has discerned that William Johnson is funding the purchase of the land by smuggling and selling British tea from the ships at the docks. A stage requires a spectacle and I may know the play. The play is twofold. The Sons of Liberty get to send a message to England and you rob William Johnson of his financing. Your village will be saved. On December 16th, Connor leads the Sons of Liberty in raiding the ships, fighting back the British and dumping the tea profit centre of both the British and William Johnson into the harbour waters. The village has been saved for now, but America will never be the same again. The revolution has officially begun. The threat to the village is stemmed, but the Templar threat is still ever present. You should have killed him. There was no need. Time will tell if you speak the truth. Connor took no pleasure in killing, but if it stands in the way of liberty, he would do so in a heartbeat. He pledged his blade to the people, liberating areas of the city from the hands of oppressors and recruiting those that would aid in this endeavor. Wherever he could help, he gave back power to the people so they could live in freedom. He saw a way of life away from control and greed. Indeed, he looked to create that ideal in his new home. Surrounding the house, the homestead boasted bountiful land. Too long had it languished untended. He encouraged a community with people who did not fit in in the wider world. He invited them to stay and put their skills towards this ideal. Our village is growing and in need of all forms of trade. Just business and a new life. People who just wanted to contribute. Farmers, carpenters, hunters, clothes makers, doctors, priests and publicans. The homestead was its own ecosystem and thrived. What resources they did not need themselves, they sold. The proceeds fed back into the community and into the fight. Below the homestead, its harbor was rejuvenated and within it, pride of place, docked the famed assassin's ship, the Aquila. Now restored to its former glory. Why, the Aquila boy! The ghost of the North Seas. Captained by the oft inebriated Robert Faulkner. She'll fetch 12 knots in a stiff gale. Ne'er a ship from here to Singapore can outrun her on her best day. What do you say we take her out and show you what she can do first hand? As Connor does in the cities, he does so on the high seas, seeing to the Templar threat wherever it lies. Victory for the Aquila! For glory! Hip, hip, hurrah! Adventure on the waves also brought mystery, as he tracked treasures in far-flung seas. A local character that frequented the harbour kept letters left by William Kidd, the famed sailor and pirate who a hundred years before Connor looked to keep artefacts from the hands of the Templars. Connor found the artefact he looked to protect. This Shard of Eden would help Connor in his fight with the Templars a precursor device to help shield its wearer from projectiles. Each time he ventured to the horizon, he always returned to the bosom of his adopted family. He will always be Canyon Kahaka, but this is the world he hopes he can help create in the whole of America, where people respect difference, embrace cooperation and love one another because of it. It's while basking in the glow of his creation that Achilles is warning becomes a reality. William Johnson has returned with all the money required to buy our land. He meets with the elders as we speak. If Connor stayed his blade once, he would not do so again. Achilles is right. They will not stop. The elders try to resist. We are not here to negotiate, nor to sell. We are here to tell you and yours to leave these lands. Perhaps you'll respond better to the sword. Connor does not hesitate. Like many Templars of the past, even in death, their convictions remain. I could have saved you all. You speak of salvation, but you were killing them. Because they would not listen. And so, it seems, neither will you. William Johnson believes the colonists will turn on the Mohawks in time. But for now, they remain. 
On his body is revealed information on his next target, John Pitcairn. John Pitcairn has risen to command level within the British Army, and his orders are to target Patriot weapons and supplies to stem the flow of the revolution. The Templars care not where they assume power. At this moment, they have placed themselves in both camps in order to have total influence. But topple Pitcairn, and Connor rids the world of a Templar and tips the scales towards the resistance. Connor can't do it alone. He joins the Sons of Liberty in helping gather the Patriots to the cause. The British are coming! And stands beside them in defending the town of Concord as Pitcairn looks to take those Patriot weapons Hold and supplies. Fall back! Fall back! We did it! They're turning tail! Connor helped aid the cause of the Patriots but failed to further his own. I should have struck when I had the chance. It would be weeks before he had another. He meets Samuel Adams at the Continental Congress in Philadelphia. The Patriots are gaining strength, becoming organized. The new Continental Army elects a leader, George Washington. An ambitious individual, he did not find the advancement prospects he desired within the British Army, and he left for politics. A decade after the French-Indian War, he finds himself at the spearhead in the revolution for independence, to the vexation of one man. Truly, there as is pay, no man better sir, suited I to the task. To assure really? The Congress that I can no think of several. Charles Lee. This do I know I you? I Come, Connor. There's someone I want you to meet. Charles Lee won't recognize that scared young boy in the face of Connor. But Charles Lee's face is seared in Connor's memory. It was Lee that killed his mother. Here, Charles Lee has been passed over for this command. A blow for the Templars. What a boon it would have been to be at the very top of this emerging power. An independent United States is close to a reality. The Templars need to grasp the reins. For Connor, Lee must wait. The grasp of the British is loosening, and it is near Bunker Hill that Connor gets his chance to meet Pitcairn. He fights his way through the British to end his life. Like so many Templar last words that have occurred before, their aim is that of peace, but method is the difference between them. And I would have succeeded had you let me play my part. Part of the puppeteer. For better we hold the strings on another. No, the strings should be severed. All should be free. And it's on his dying body that Connor discovers the next Templar plan, to assassinate Washington and place Charles Lee as his obvious successor. The man charged with completing the task is another name on the assassin wall, Thomas Hickey. Connor heads to New York, Thomas Hickey runs a counterfeiting ring in the city. Connor looks to shut it down and take Hickey out of action. Oh. Uh, ain't supposed to be none of your kind left. Suppose I'd best be rectifying that then. Get him! Connor is not the only one looking for the counterfeiters. You are both under arrest! Uh. The Patriots have shut down the ring. What are the charges? Counterfeiting! I had nothing to do with that. Listen, there are more important things at stake here. This man is planning to- ah. He awakes, imprisoned, and with only the bars separating them, he gets closer to his father than he ever has before. Thank you kindly for the rescue, gents. There can be no further mistakes, Thomas. Am I understood? What about this, the assassin? Deal with this, Charles. At once, sir. Haytham knows who Connor is. He was unaware at the time that he had a child, and he is not known for long, but he knows. He will not meet his eyes. Lee remains. They were unaware of the rise of the assassins here on American shores until now. They capitulated long ago with Achilles. Your meddling in the revolution has caused us no small measure of grief. It cannot continue. Our work is too important. The child in the forest was you. You know, all of this might have been avoided had you only done what I asked. What does he mean? I think I have an idea. Yes, two birds with one stone. That idea is to frame Connor for the murder of the prison warden and accuse him of the plot to kill George Washington. While Washington looks over the gallows to see his plotter hanged, the Templars will complete their plan. But as Connor approaches the noose, he sees the assassin order he has rebuilt with Achilles come to his aid. He knows not which of them severed the rope, but he is free. Free to stop Thomas Hickey and end the plot. Go! Thomas Hickey was a faithful servant to the Templars, but his reason for service was not as grand as some. 
They has the money. They has the power. That's the reason I threw him with them. That's the only reason you're just some blind fool who's always chasing butterflies, whereas I'm the type of guy who likes to have a beer in one hand and a tea in the other. Connor's purpose stretches further. The plot scuppered for now, he joins Washington in Philadelphia for a pivotal moment for their country. They officially declare independence. The British are all but finished. The months draw on without event. Despite the inevitable impending return of the Templars, it is quiet. Connor travels to the Continental Army's encampment at Valley Forge. He can help Washington and possibly the assassin cause as well. Supply caravans meant for the camp have gone missing. I suspect treachery. A traitor named Benjamin Church, recently released from prison, has vanished as well. The two events are surely related. Connor investigates reports on the Southern Road. Benjamin Church is an enemy of the Patriots, passing information to the British, but he also has other enemies. Connor hopes to find sign of Church here, but instead has a meeting he has long rehearsed in his head. Father, Connor, any last words? <clears throat> Come to check up on Church? Make sure he's stolen enough for your British brothers? Benjamin Church is no brother of mine. Haytham sees the man his child has become without his influence. He is awash with emotions, pride, envy, possibly even hatred, but he sees opportunity and a dovetail of purpose. To seek revenge on the traitor church and subconsciously the chance to know the child he sired. Perhaps some time together might do us good. You are my son after all and might still be saved from your ignorance. Connor's silence speaks to an agreement. Excellent. Shall we be off? Their accord lasted the following weeks, as they tracked a weak trail through the snows of the frontier, the burnt out shells of the Great Fire, and bustling docklands of New York. Speed, Connor! We need more speed! Culminating in a sea voyage to the Caribbean, where Church looked to profit from his theft of Patriot supplies. Throughout their partnership, they found common ground but just as many differences as has been held between Assassin and Templar for centuries. Order, purpose, direction. It's your lot that means to confound with this nonsense talk of freedom. But they stuck for now to their common ground. Haytham did not know his father well. He lost him at a young age, but he settled into a shorthand with Connor, although one of critique. You could have killed me when we first met. What stayed your hand? Curiosity. Any other questions? Oh, I'm sorry. Would you like me to come along and hold your hand, perhaps? Provide kind words of encouragement? It's almost as though you want him to escape. You do it. Why me? Because I said so. Now go. How is it you came to captain a ship, given the way you say? It was at least resemblant of a father's love for his son. You I recognize, not the savage. He is my son. But bubbling under this is Connor's resentment he has always held for his father. The Templars, Charles Lee. I found my mother burning alive. Charles Lee is responsible for her death by your order. It's impossible. I gave no such order. It is done, and I'm all out of forgiveness. Further discussion may jeopardize Connor's immediate mission. They must find church, and they do so on the Caribbean Sea. They board the ship and take their prize. Enough! Where are the supplies you stole? Go to hell. Connor aims to understand the mind of Benjamin Church. Like Braddock, he had drifted from his order. It's all a matter of perspective. There is no single path through life that's right and fair and does no harm. As dedicated as you are to fighting Templars, who themselves see their work as just. Connor understands this. He always has. Good people do bad things out of ignorance and fear. But he fights for what he thinks, knows is right, and he will not see people controlled, manipulated, oppressed. He fights for freedom, and he is wary of the mindset of the Patriots. Do they have everyone's freedom in mind? And like his father hopes of him, he hopes Haytham can be saved from his ideologies. Their work together is not done. They return with the stolen supplies. Both Assassin and Templar want rid of the crown. In order to defeat them, they must know their plans. They capture British officers to find out. They are to march on New York. When do they begin? Two days from now. I must warn Washington. They head 
to Valley Forge. We should be sharing what we know with Lee, not Washington. You seem to think I favor him, but my enemy is a notion, not a nation. You oppose tyranny, injustice. These are just symptoms. Their true cause is human weakness. You have said much, yes, but you have shown me nothing. Then we'll have to remedy that then, won't we? As Connor delivers news of the British attack, Haytham finds just the evidence to deliver the revelation he has kept to himself for now. And what's this? Private correspondence. Oh, of course it is. Would you like to know what it says, Connor? Washington, the Patriots, are due to attack a native village. Reacting to intel that they are working with the British against them, Washington's orders are to burn the village, salt the land, eradicate its people. The village in question is Connor's. Not the first time either. Tell them what you did 14 years ago. Since that day, the day he lost his mother, he blamed the Templars for her death, Charles Lee specifically, but it was another. During the Seven Years' War, as the natives worked with the French, it was Washington's orders to stop this threat at any cost. Washington ordered his village to burn, and he does so again. And so now you see what happens to this great man when under duress. He makes excuses and does a great many things, in fact, except take responsibility. Enough! Connor knows there are many minds and many moving parts to a collective greed. Washington is guilty, yes, but he has his village to save. Not to save his nation, but to enact a notion. Connor is an assassin, and he stands for those that struggle to stand for themselves. He realizes he can't forge peace on such disparate ideals of how to live. He must do this alone. A warning to you both! Choose to follow me or oppose me and I will kill you. Connor rides for his village. As Charles Lee lit the touch paper before the massacre at Boston, he does so here. The Templars have sculpted the perfect scenario. They have forewarned the village of the Patriot attack. They will see the British fall under a preemptive strike from the natives and in doing so, Charles Lee will see the certain death of the natives he so despises. Connor tries to head off the Mohawk attack. He must stop it. He must save the village. He subdues who he can until he meets his childhood friend, his brother, Canon Dorgan. Charles Lee had spread lies to manipulate the village, that Connor wants the end of the village, that he has been corrupted. The hate and the betrayal that this has engendered is unassailable. Connor has no choice. Another of those he loves has to die due to greed. Charles Lee is acting like every powerful Templar before him. He is pulling the strings and manipulating the tide of change on both sides. His plan has always been to weaken the British while at the same time undermine the leadership of George Washington. Lee wants the seat of power in this new world. Lee does such during the Battle of Monmouth. Connor aids the Patriot victory despite Lee's tactics. Charles Lee has betrayed you. He forced retreat in the midst of battle, hoping the lost would take the lives of your men and see you relieved of your command. What? That man is your enemy and he will not stop until you are dead or dishonored. Should you choose to spare Lee's life, then I will take it myself. Enjoy your victory, Commander. It will be the last I deliver you. Connor hates Washington. He has every right to, but at least his leadership is free of Templar grandeur, and at least he is steering the country towards revolution. He no longer needs to guide this ship. It will reach his destination of its own accord. They will get their independence. Charles Lee is the only person who can stop it. Connor knows what he must do. In order to open the door, and gain access to whatever is in there, whatever the ones that came before needs Desmond to get to. The assassins must have Haytham's artifact, but before then, they need the power sources. The first one Desmond found switched the lights on. The second taken from Manhattan store movement behind the door. Sean hacked into the database and found news of more. They traveled to Brazil to find a third artifact. Just like in New York, Daniel Cross was there to scupper them. Desmond narrowly escaped with the prize. News of the fourth and final artifact came from Egypt. Desmond needed to concentrate on Haytham's amulet. William would step up to the plate and retrieve it from the museum there. Desmond woke from the animus to hear the news. Abstergo has your dad. Where? Italy. 
Same place they were holding you. And the man holding him is familiar to Desmond too. Hello again, Mr. Miles. Warren Vidic, the man that kept him prisoner, forced him into the Animus, turned Lucy Stillman to his will, and now has his father. I propose a trade. Bring me the apple, and I'll return your father to you, no worse for the wear. Desmond knows William would want them to move on, find another power source, focus on the mission, but despite their differences, the parental missteps, the misconnection, he loves his father. There is no question what he must do. They leave for Italy with the apple, the apple left by Ezio beneath the Colosseum that opened the door to the Grand Temple, the apple that holds so much power. They know I'm here, Rebecca. There's no way they don't. Subdue this object, please. Desmond doesn't need to be shown. He knows exactly where to begin, where it all started. But Warren Vidic's pet, his best soldier, stands in his way. Give me the apple. All right, Desmond. Game's over. Not now. Not now. What the hell was that? That was Cross's adult brain. Too long spent in the Animus in the care of Abstergo. The care of Warren Vidic, so close to the apple held by Desmond, it triggered the bleeding effect. Kill the bastard, and then drink me the apple. Cross was no longer a threat. He could not defend himself. Wait. Where's Vidic? I'll let you in. Desmond has the apple, but he has no intention of handing it over. You want it? Fine. Here it is. Wait! No! He knows how to wield it. It was meant for him, left for him. After all, he's had the practice. He has his father. They have the final power source, and Desmond has the apple. With the three power sources in hand, Desmond begins to bring the temple back online. When doing so, the ever-present Juno tells stories. Stories of the ones that came before and their failure to stop the sun. Four towers would be built to pull her fury into this place and dispel it. They did not have the time. The first tower was only partially completed, and the project was abandoned. But while we labored on other endeavors, a few returned. They thought to automate the process. Metal might finish what flesh could not. They tried to use their existing shield technology to perhaps shield the Earth, but they could not scale it enough. They looked to harness the power of the apple, the phenomenon that multiple minds harnessed to it could change the very fabric of reality. Their aim was to place the apple in the atmosphere to do this, just as modern day Abstergo hoped to do. Once placed, a sentence would be uttered, make us safe. But they could not control it. Minerva took charge of a divination project to enact a future solution. They created a device so complex as to predict the infinite possibilities of the future, enough so they could communicate with future allies. That device was called the Eye, but every future they predicted led to the same outcome, the destruction of the world. They turned to bioengineering, Juno's project, to change their genetic makeup to resist the effects of the cataclysm. In this manner, we might thrive in a world made poisonous. Juno's husband, Aita, volunteered to test the process. He was consumed with pain. He begged for the end. I pleaded with him to give us time to find another way. But, but there, there wasn't, wasn't one, one. Not, not for him. him. Not for us. Juno could see their race's fate was sealed, for their bodies at least. But what if they could save their minds? What if they could transfer it to another vessel, one more sturdy, like stone? For this, they found a way. It proved easy enough to enter. But to leave required something more, something wrong. And so this too they abandoned. I wondered though, were they right to turn away? However Juno is communicating with the assassins now, it's clear that before her kind passed, she suffered great pain. Somehow, she is even able to communicate with us digitally. 
hacking the emails and leaving written diatribes of her disdain for the human race, who were inferior, animalistic, wretched things. A hatred that is familiar to Desmond. He has seen it through the ages, none more so than with Charles Lee, and his similar disdain for the natives and those that oppose the Templars. In one email, Juno describes how she lost her father to human hands during humanity's revolution. In the temple, there is no Minerva, no Jupiter, just Juno. It is clear she has no love for humanity. Why is she helping them? Whatever's on the other side of that door, it benefits Juno. We need to be careful. The temple is now powered. They just need the key. Home stretch, Desmond. I can feel it. Haytham has that key, but he is nowhere to be found. Connor still hopes to spare him, to make him see sense. But in the homestead, his other father, his mentor that gave him the strength to fight, his strength is waning. Connor, he's asking for you. Washington spared Lee's life. So long as he lives, all are in danger. The same is true for your father. But with Lee gone, my father might... Listen to me. Both men must die. Connor leaves the ailing Achilles to construct his plan. Lee currently takes refuge in Fort George in New York. Connor can't enter from the ground. He will use the underground system to gain access and with the help from his allies, who will cause distraction at range from the sea. In the chaos, I will slip inside, find Charles Lee and silence him forever. Connor infiltrates. The guns rage. The bells ring out. He continues to the heart of the fort. Where are you, Charles? Gone. Uh, come now. You cannot hope to match me, Connor. Uh, give me Lee! Impossible. He is the promise of a better future. Haytham knows he cannot turn the tide in Connor's mind. Connor knows the same. There was a time for Haytham, but that time is long gone. He is too old, too buried in the work he has done, in the lives he has taken, in the cause he has championed. Lee must live to see this world thrive under Templar ideals. He is their best chance. He does not hope to best his son. Maybe he will. He just needs to stand in his way. We did not harm your people. Ah. We did not support the crown. We worked to see this land united and at peace under our rule. Ah. Surrender, and I will spare you. Brave words from a man about to die. We require no creed, no indoctrination by desperate old men. All we need is that the world be as it is. And this is why the Templars will never be destroyed. Haytham has the upper hand, but he knows the assassins. He knows where they wear their hidden blades. He wears one himself. To truly give the Templars the world, all he has to do is use it. But who he is? The life he has lived, the product of that stolen summer with Zio at his mercy. He won't. He leaves his son's blade arm free. He has given Lee the chance to flee. It's up to him now. And it's up to Connor. I will not weep and wonder what might have been. I'm sure you understand. What might have been is a story unto itself. As a young boy, Haytham was leading a different path until that path was diverted for him. Not unlike the relationship he had with Connor, not unlike the relationship William has with Desmond, Haytham's father was cold, distant, but intent on instilling skills and a mindset. His father was an assassin and before he could impart that wisdom, he was killed. Unbeknownst to Haytham by a man he would come to know well. That man would become his mentor and his master. He was a Templar named Reginald Birch. Before Haytham found out the truth, Birch trained him, taught him the Templar mindset and inducted him. He lived a life he was born to despise, a Templar life. Around the time Zio was having his son, Haytham acted on the knowledge that Birch was his father's killer and took his life. Revenge was its only outcome. Haytham now was who he was. He was a Templar, and he still longed for a world under its ideology. 
Over the preceding years, he would wrestle with this. After so long trying to unite his opposing thoughts inherent from his father and a Templar life he has led, sick of being pulled in opposing directions, now, here, he accepts the world as it is. He accepts who he is. He accepts who his son is. Like Haytham's father, Connor was an assassin. Connor's grandfather's name was Edward Kenway. His story is yet to be told. We've got a problem. Haytham doesn't have the amulet anymore. Before bidding Lee to flee, before facing his son allowing Charles to escape, he gave him the amulet. Charles Lee now leads the Templar Order, and Connor must track him down and face him. Like his father, Connor has been pulled in myriad directions. Is he Canyon Kahaka? American, patriot, homestead owner, assassin? Like his father, he must remember who he truly is, a guardian of those oppressed. I cannot afford to be consumed with doubt. The people need me. Now more than ever, I must stop the Templars. I will kill Charles Lee. Connor knows he will find him at the memorial service for his father. Connor knows the Templars know he'll be there. He doesn't care. He needs to face his enemy. I will kill you, Connor. This I swear. Not here, though. Not today. First, I'll destroy all you hold dear. I'll burn that homestead of yours to the ground and roast the severed heads of your precious founding fathers in its flames. You can try, Charles. But as with all your schemes, this too will end in failure. Take him away. He knew Charles would not strike here. He knew when held the Templars could not keep him for long. He knew that his presence would unsettle Charles and he knew despite his threats, his defiant eyes would strike fear into Charles Lee. Connor would just need to wait for his moment and with patience, it came. Charles's time in the Americas has come to an end. The threat of Connor's next move is too much for him. He knows he is no match. Lee is at the harbor booking passage from these shores. Connor's there to meet him. He gives chase through the harbor into the shipyard. Why do you persist? You try so hard, but it always ends the same. Yet you fight. You resist. Why? Because no one else will. His midriff punctured, blood loss clouding his vision, he will not be stopped. He winged Lee. Connor tracks him up the Charles River to Monmouth, to the Last Drink Tavern. So long has he waited for this moment. Charles Lee was not responsible for his mother's death like he thought, but his leadership of the Templars have been and will be responsible for so much more pain in the world. This is not for Connor. This is for the people he protects. Charles Lee knows this is the end of the line. There is nothing else to be said. Connor finally has the amulet, the key to the Grand Temple. The task set him by the spirit all those years ago has been completed. Recovered from his wounds, Connor returns to the village. His endeavors were meant to save it, to keep his people here, unopposed by the changes outside the valley. But the village has moved on without him, headed west to delay the inevitable. All that is left is the door to the Nexus, to Juno. Now you must hide it where none shall think to look, and then in time, what once was, shall be again. I do not understand. Nor need you. But what of my people? You have saved this place, as was your people's purpose, and that matters most. Remember, you must hide the amulet where none might find it. Connor started out all those years ago on a journey to save his people, but his people have gone. The independence, the freedom he helped the Patriots attain has been achieved, but not for all. Although the Templars are beaten for now, his fight is not over. 
Not until freedom prevails for everyone. Raduna Gerdun is an assassin, but in the homestead, by the community he built, he's known as Connor. This is the world he hopes to see multiplied across the land, where peace, laughter, and unity prevail. Where people share success, share problems, and work together for peace. Not a nation, but a notion. This is where Connor belongs. When Connor arrived, it was a shell that housed a broken man. He was once a great assassin. He was once a happy family man. His story we may yet hear more of, but for now, the house, the lands, they are repaired and that broken man found hope again. Achilles. As Achilles sat in his chair for the last time, he could be happy that the cause he fought for for so long would be in good hands. The hands he helped shape. In the young native boy, Achilles saw hope. So much so, he gave him a name very dear to his heart. The name he gave to the little boy he lost years before. He lost everything the day he lost his family. But in Connor, he glimpsed a future. The community they built together gathered round as they buried the old man on the hill. I will make you proud, old man. And it is here that Connor will hide the amulet at the request of the spirit. Guarded by the grave of his namesake, Achilles' infant son Connor and his wife, and Achilles, a family, at rest on the hill overlooking the community that has been born. And that is where the assassins in 2012 find it. Guess this is it. We're right behind you. They make their way to the door to the inner sanctum of the Grand Temple. Moment of truth. With his assassins behind him, his friends, his family, he meets Juno at the altar of what he hopes is humanity's savior. Here, at last, you know our story now, of how we tried, of how we failed, all our hopes extinguished, save one. One of their ideas to repel the sun was to do so with the construction of four towers to absorb the sun. Time allowed them to barely complete one. Although abandoning the project, they left the job to machines. They automated the project. It took centuries, long after the ones that came before had succumbed. The machines finished their work. To activate it needed just one thing. Your touch, a spark, a spark to save the world. Wait. Do not touch the pedestal. Minerva? Minerva, returning as a projection to warn Desmond. You? But how? You left! You destroyed the device! Did you think there was only one? You must not free her. Free her? One of the projects the Triad abandoned was that of Transcendence. Rehousing consciousness to another vessel. Juno resurrected this technology and moved her mind to the very fabric of this temple waiting for the moment she could be freed. Juno's priority was not to save the world from the sun. While we worked to save the world, she sought instead to conquer it. She used our machines to set her plans in motion. The eye that Minerva built to divine the future was appropriated by Juno to use it for her own ends, to deliver a message to Desmond in the Colosseum, to kill Lucy Stillman. When we discovered her treachery, we put a stop to it. And then we left. But first we called to you. To Desmond and the assassins to come to the temple to try where they had failed. Minerva wanted to save humanity in the future, even if she could not save her own species. With the message sent, she destroyed the eye in the temple. But there was another, kept safe by Minerva, used to project to this moment. Now I see we were deceived. She survived, she endured, and then she began to work. After the temple was sealed, she transferred her consciousness to the temple, to the first civilization computational hardware within it, to be immortal but trapped. Whatever her plan was before her treachery was discovered, she now had thousands of years, and the power of the temple to communicate through the pieces of Eden scattered throughout the world to communicate with humanity through time. The tribe of the Mohawk Valley, Subject 16, with Desmond, to formulate a new plan to free herself and set about conquering the Earth. 
Her message to Desmond in the temple under the Colosseum as he stepped towards Lucy, blade drawn, was cryptic. It is done. The way lies all before you. Only she remains to be found. Awaken the Sixth. In the Grand Temple, as Desmond placed those power sources, Juno talked of six methods the first civilization attempted to save the world. The sixth of those she described was transcendence. She was saved, but trapped by the sixth method and she needed to be free, to be awakened. What she needed was a spark. Desmond's high concentration of first civilization DNA. The touch from him would activate the towers, the towers that took so long to build. They would absorb the sun's power, saving the world, but somehow transferring Juno to another vessel, one in which she can leave these walls, seek the power she craves, and an opportunity to punish, enslave the species she so despises. Minerva's message to the assassins is that it's too late. In touching the pedestal, the catastrophe may be averted, but a worse catastrophe would take its place. Only touch the pedestal and the world will be saved. Better the world burn than she be loosed upon it. Is that so? Show him then. Minerva long ago divined what would happen when the sun's rays hit. The world would burn. Its people would perish save a lucky few. The few, people like Desmond and his fellow assassins, safe underground, protected. When they emerged, Desmond would become a leader amongst them, inspiring unity to rebuild, to be at one with each other in peace. That word would spread and take seed, but in time, like all great leaders, his body would fail. Those words would be taken and corrupted and the cycle of humanity's failings would begin again. So tell me, how is this better? They will enslave your kind, Desmond. Is this not why you fight? Is this not why you came here? To ensure more than just your race's future, but its freedom? What future? What freedom? Billions dead and the whole cycle begun anew? Enough! You must not do this. Whatever Juno's planning, however terrible it might seem today, we'll find a way to stop it. But the alternative, what you want, there's no hope there. It's done, Minerva. The decision's made. Save the world, but free a tyrant. That is the decision. Desmond will not wipe the slate clean, killing billions. However bleak the state of the world, however terrible the things to come, there are still assassins out in the world that will dedicate their lives to changing it, to freeing it, to stopping those that look to oppress it. You need to go, all of you, now. Get as far away from here as you can, son. In his time in the temple, Desmond achieved something he never thought he would. He became his father's son again. Desmond is the world's savior, but his father and his fellow assassins will be its hope. They must live on. It's already started. I need to do this now. So go. Go! Desmond is not the boy he was that fled from the farm all those years ago. He ran from a cause he felt was not his. His father knew he was special, so wanted him to be prepared. Abstergo knew he was special and slaved him to the Animus. The ones that came before knew he was special and pulled all the strings for him to be here before the pedestal. But he was no longer anyone's puppet. This was his cause, his choice. And in touching the pedestal, he would give humanity a chance, however small, to be free. It is done. The world is saved. You played your part well, Desmond. But now, now it's time that I played mine. To be continued. Whatever Juno goes on to do, it will be without Desmond to stop her. But Desmond has left a legacy and an ideal to strive for. The assassins he left behind will fight on in his name. The word will spread of his sacrifice and the threat they will need to face in the form of Juno and in the form of Abstergo. After Desmond touched the pedestal, after the other assassins left the cave into the dawn of a saved world, Abstergo tracked down the location of the temple. 
gained access and found the body of Desmond. Something as precious to them as any artifact because of what his body contains, his DNA. Desmond is no longer Subject 17 to the Templars. He is now Sample 17. And within this DNA, the next important figure in history exists. The figure we visit next in this series. Make sure to like the video for the algorithm, subscribe and hit the bell to be informed of when this next instalment hits, and if you would like to support this ongoing series and get to see the next video weeks in advance, become a patron via Patreon. I'm the Patient Wolf, and this has been the complete story of Desmond Miles.